trends out of the way. Um, anyway, Simon Johnson. Um, and we have Trevon Morris here, who's a part of our team. And Julian Morrison, um, who's also a part of our team. That they, they really, um, really provide some support um, for the production of everything. So for this session, we chose to do a walkthrough of evaluation because, you know, the question uh, is always asked, you know, how, how do you come up with a price? Do you just, if something is worth $3, do you just say, oh, I think it's worth um, $5? I think it's worth $6. How does that work? So we're going to show you a bit of the science of it. And then at the end, we're going to go into more of the real world. So I'm going to send the documents over the, the Excel file over Zoom. So let me test this out. It should work. Give me a second. Okay, it's sending now. Just let me know if you get it, please. Everybody got it? All right, thanks, Gadeen. All right. Yes, I got it. Okay. All right, thanks guys. So you can just open open that sheet, um, well, the workbook. And I mean, you don't have to look at it yet. We're gonna get um, familiar with a little of the basics first, and then we can jump into the Excel workbook. So I'll just open it on my side. And yeah, remember this is Remember that this is a, an, an interactive session. So if you have questions, um, if you need some support, just let me know, all right? And if you're not speaking, um, just mute your mic. Well, I feel like I've been saying that. I think I've said mute your mic like 5 billion times. Uh, or I'm talking on mute. Yeah, so. Without further ado, let me just start. All right, so we're going to do a brief um, overview of what a financial analysis is. Um, first question though, is everybody familiar with um, financial analysis? Um, when I say financial analysis, it doesn't mean you have to go into the numbers. Are you familiar with financials, like the financials of a company? Have you ever read the financials of a company? Yes. Okay, good, good. Um, anybody else? I just want to know, you know, how, how, how we should proceed exactly based on the, the guys that are here now. Um, welcome, welcome, Jermaine. Hey, Simon. All right, so you didn't miss anything. We're really just about to jump in. All right. So, why I asked about if anybody has ever been exposed to financial. So, we're going to jump into um, an overview of, finan of financial statements, um, particularly the income statement the balance sheet and the cash flow statement. And this is really just a, a rather brief overview. We have a far more detailed video um, on our YouTube channel. 
so you guys can check that out and you have some time and there are a lot of timestamps there so you can choose where in the video you want to go because it's pretty long um so financial analysis is the process of evaluating businesses projects budgets and other finance related entities so long story short financial analysis is just you looking at the numbers and making sense of them right what does what does fifty dollars mean in comparison to last year to what happened last year what does a profit of fifty dollars mean when you compare it to uh when you compare that to another company so that's really what we're talking about so and financial analysis is used to assess a lot of people know this part the profitability of um a company so profitability meaning okay how profitable is this company now um how much money did they make this year compared to last year and so it financial analysis is, is mostly what i would say um is mostly we call backward looking um even though you do have forward looking um on it in it as well <clears throat> so here i have some different types of financial analysis and we won't do all of these things <laughs> just going to do a few things so um you were saying something all right so we have our liquidity analysis uh profitability analysis um, and liquidity, it, it sounds exactly what, like what it is. When you think about liquidity, you think about liquid, you think about water. Um, when you think about water, you think about free flowing. So in finance, when you think about liquid, you think about money, right? You think about cash itself, right? So liquidity pertains to um, the business's access to cash and their use of cash. Um, Matthew is asking, why did we choose Creamy? Well, we chose Creamy. I did a poll on Twitter like a week ago. I don't think it was so, so long, a few days ago. And well, surprisingly, everybody said that most people wanted to um, wanted us to look into Creamy. So we decided, hey, let's look into Creamy. All right? So that's how it was shown. All right, everybody is seeing this properly. So these are the three main financial statements of a company. We have our income statement, we have the balance sheet, and we have a cash flow statement. The income statement basically shows the total sales or what we call revenue that a company makes. So let's say talking about a bag juice company, the income statement shows that revenue line is the total amount of bag juice, the value of the total amount of bag juice that is sold. So it shows the profits of the company um, and the expenses of said company. The balance sheet, I, I, I think Julian explains that the best. <laughs> so so, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that one up to Julian. All right, so um, okay. All right, so the balance sheet, is essentially the belly of the business. And we hear a lot about net worth and individuals can have net worth and companies can also have net worth. So the net worth is essentially the assets minus the liabilities. And we also refer to that figure as equity. So essentially when a business grows its net, net worth or when it grows its equity, it's a sign of financial health because it means that the assets are growing faster than the liabilities are growing to a greater extent than the liabilities. So that's the basic outlay of what we look for first. There are some businesses that have negative net worth or negative equity, and we call those businesses distressed. Balance sheets can be classified, meaning that they can be categorized in terms of liquidity, as Simon mentioned before. So we can see the current assets separated from the non-current assets 
and the current liability is separated from the non-current liability. So those balance sheets are called, called classified balance sheets. So they can come in different formats. We essentially want to see the financial health of the business because the balance sheet is really the belly of the business. When we say the business is doing well, we're really looking at the balance sheet. That's what's, that's what's showing us how the, firm, the firm's health is doing. So and that's the know, synopsis. Another, another way to look on it as well is, is um, it's, it's what the business has and what it owes. So what you have minus what you owe. So Simon has a, 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 a Samsung Galaxy phone that's worth, worth nothing now, but that's worth $20,000. And Simon owes Julian um, $10,000. In a very simple sense, my net worth, if that's all I have and, and, and owe, is $10,000, which is just 20 minus the $10,000. Right? The cash flow statement is a bit different from the income statement. So there's a reason why I said that the, the, the income statement looks at profits because there are items, there are line items in the income statement that are non-cash, meaning that it, it, it's really just an accounting recognition of something rather than actual cash moving from one place to the next, right? So when you when you sell a bag juice, you get cash, um, and when you pay for the the water that you use to make the bag juice, you pay cash. However, one of those items um, that what we we'll, we'll call non-cash is what we we'll call depreciation, right? And depreciation is really just the we can call the annual are periodic degradation in the in, in, in our total assets. So if you remember that Samsung Galaxy phone, right? Um, and boy, a phone is a very good example because if anybody on here have a phone, you know that um, your technology gets outdated very quickly, right? So when you buy a phone for $20, the second you, $20,000, the second you open that box, it's not worth $20,000 anymore. And over time, as you use the phone, right, the value of the phone goes down. So just in very simple terms, the, that value that it goes down by is depreciation. So for a company that sells bag juice, the machines that they use to produce the bag juice, they what we call depreciate um, on a periodic basis. And that is recorded in the income statement, but it's not a movement of cash. Because unlike, say, when the machine depreciate, the money that's within your till or, or, we, or your bank account actually goes down. So the cash flow statement, which is the third one here, purple, the purple line, makes an adjustment for that. So, and, and for other items as well. So the cash flow statement adjusts the income statement to just show cash inflow and outflow. And... That can be very important because guess what? If your cash outflow and boy, this one is is is, is straightforward. If you're if you spend in cash more than you earn, then what must happen? Is either you have to go spend less eventually or earn more, or you have to go borrow, right? Um, so the same things that can be applied to the income statement can be um applied uh, to your personal life can be applied here. Um, anybody have any questions so far? Please. Yes, Simo, I wanted to say something to support mm -hmm. um, what you just mentioned. So the income statement, okay, so accounting typically uses a principle called accru accrual, uh, the accrual concept. So what accruals do is that they make adjustments for different factors that happen during the course of business. So let's say, for example, I have a sweetie shop and an order of sweeties come in from a pharmacy. And that order comes in and I book that order as revenues. It doesn't mean that all those individual sweeties were sold and I connected that cash, right? 
I have just booked the order itself as revenues because I expect the pharmacy to pay me cash at that later date. So it is really the trust that I have in that pharmacy for that specific order that allows me to record that figure as revenue. So that's not cash. So revenue is not cash. So that is how you start to have the distinction between what happens on the income statement versus the cash flow statement. So it's, it's the business's activities for the period in two different languages. So one is cash language and one is accrual language. And the accrual language is the profit and loss or the income statement. So it's filled with a lot of estimates. And that's why we need to look at both of them to say one with the estimates and one with just cash alone. And you know, a, a very important no, no, to the next thing, why we have these three statements? Because you're asking, Simon, why don't we just have income statement on one slide so we can see the entire thing, balance sheet on one slide and cash flow on one side, slide. The thing is that they're, they're, they, these three statements are related and it's actually the interaction between these statements that is very important. So if you understand how these three statements work together, you can see where the business is coming from, where it is, and where it's going, just from, just from looking at these three statements for, for a company. So the income statement, and we're looking, we are, we are following the, uh, the, the arrows now. How is the, how is the income statement linked to the balance sheet, right? Every year, that you make money. Let's say, and Julian, we know you're a wealthy man. So let's say every year <laughs> you make uh, uh, $100,000, right? And let's say you make $100,000 after all expenses. So that's the money that you either save or invest. Right? Well, let me just give you the answer. There are two things that you can do with that money. You can save it and put it down um, for another for another another day, a rainy day. So you build your, your capital base. Or you can invest it, you know, you can go out and you can buy stocks or whatever. Or or the other part of investment is you might just go out and say, you know what, grandma, you support me for the year, just take this. It's my dividends to you. So take a look at 50,000 and go take care of yourself, you know? So how that net income is linked to your balance sheet is, so think of your balance sheet, as Julian said, as your net worth. At the end of the year, if your boss, let's say after the end of the year, after you spend everything, you have $100,000 left, that $100,000 um, is added to what we call your retained earnings. So, so that's your retained earnings from previous years. Now, the entire $100 may not come over because you may get that $100 and say, look, um, boy, I want to support grandma, as I said. So I'm going to give grandma this or um, I want to buy something for myself. I want to buy a phone, etc." So the money that you made this year, the income is added to the retained earnings from last year, less whatever you pay out. And what you pay out in company language is what you call it, dividends, right? Any questions about that? See, a lot of the ladies demanding dividends on, on Twitter. <laughs> and I'm not talking company dividends, but that conversation is another day. No, no comment, no comment. <laughs> yeah. And, and guys, remember to feel free to ask questions you know, if you have any questions at all. Right? So... So, um, Julian, Matthew's asking, what's your view on dividends for small net worth investors? So, okay. So, so what, what, what Matthew means here is if you're a, a small investor like me, and well, not Julian, but like myself, you know, um, is, is dividends really important to you? Or should dividends really be important to you? My personal thing is that um, income is income, and I like income and dividend is income. However, when I started investing and buying my couple, my couple units, my dividend checks were $20, $6, $5. That not really brushed me, right? However, 
if I invested into a into a company that I thought would grow exponentially over um, the next couple of months or the next year, my return on that may be 20, 30 percent instead of a dividend yield of let's say one or less than one percent. So my personal perspective, and Julian's may differ, my personal perspective is that while smaller investors can focus on on capital appreciation and not have dividend income as you know or income or income type stocks as your sole focus you will realize that as your portfolio grows and as your portfolio gets larger you are going to want that income or those income stocks so as your net worth increases you're going to want that um income play are those dividend stocks to quote unquote stabilize your portfolio so you're going to want cash to come in so for example you can think of people that are have retired or are close to retirement right those those people um that have retired or are close to retirement yeah capital appreciation is nice but grandma want cash because she might not be able, uh, she might not be getting constant income into her portfolio. Matter of fact, there are a lot of investors that live off their dividend income from their from their portfolios or their bond income. Right? For you experts have commenced a thorough investigation, and we've already assured the room that we give you. So Matthew responded and said, "Yes, small investors can benefit more from what other people care about dividends." Um, Example, mail pack. Okay, oh, can, can benefit more from what other people care about dividends. Okay, Julian, um, you have a view on that? Well, just, just a few things. So dividends have a lot to do with preference. So it depends on what you like as an investor. Some people like to receive the, the cash as Simon stipulated or mentioned. Um, and that might not appeal to you. Personally, I like to be paid to hold assets. I mean, if I hold the asset, I clearly believe in its economic viability. But if I'm going to be paid to hold the asset, then why not? The other thing is dividend return and capital appreciation, they're actually two different things in principle. So a lot of times people might say, you know, why should I take 4% in dividends well, I can get 300% return on the price, but they're two different things. They're not comparable. You have to compare income return with income return and price return with price return. You have to compare apples to apples. So what do I mean? The return that you get on a stock, let's say, for example, we'll buy a stock for $10, right? And we'll hold it for a year and it goes up to $15, right? The additional $5, is the price return, right? If we were to realize that gain. However, during the period, the stock paid a dividend of $2. Now, we might say the $2 is less than the $5 we got, so dividends don't make any sense. But the fact of the matter is, you didn't just get a $5, $5 return in total. You got the $5 return plus the $2 return. So in total, you got a return of $17 on the $10 that you invested. Five in form of the price and two in form of the dividend. So there are two separate things and they must be assessed as two separate things. They cannot be compared side by side um, because they are different. So it's a matter of preference, it's a matter of need and keeping that kind of perspective to know where you're at as an investor and what it is that you're into. The other thing is that $2 that I was being paid, I can, be, I can use that $2 to purchase more of the stock. You might say $2 per share might not sound sexy, but the fact of the matter is that's $2 less I have to come out of my pocket or out of my investment account to make new investments. So why wouldn't I want that? That's reducing my cost of reinvestment. So why wouldn't I want to reduce my reinvestment cost? Ah, see, see the guy is saying it's, it's compounding you're talking about. Yeah, That's right. Compound and that actually compounding. increases your return. So that's the thought process. Yeah. Um, Hector has a question. Hector? Apologies, no question. Okay, all right, cool. All right, so let's, let's just finish up this slide. 
All right. So as we're saying, you add the income to your retained earnings and your net income is the first item on the cash flow statement. Remember what I said, you know, the cash flow statement adjusts the income, the, um, the net income, because the net income is not all cash. So what it basically does is break, is take the net income and take out things that should not be there and add things that should really be there, right? The cash flow statement now, that last item, uh, it's not always the last, but the item that says net cash flow, when you add up all the sections of the cash flow statement, that cash balance is comes back to your balance sheet, right? So, so, so that's just a little thing. The cash balance in the cash flow statement, it, it's the same thing as the cash balance in your balance sheet. So sometimes when we look on financial statements, you can always know when something is wrong because certain things must just must add up, you know? Um, well, almost literally, certain things must add up. So we're going to look at financial ratios um, a bit more, but what ratios help us to do is compare um, a company's performance to previous years of that same company, and it helps you to compare your performance to other companies. So I made, um, if I'm Jamaica Broilers and I made a billion dollar this year. What does a billion dollars mean compared, compared to the amount of sales that I made, right? What does it mean? So what we do is what we call, you can call it a horizontal analysis or your trend analysis. You can look on previous years and say, oh, that $1 billion, I made $10 billion in sales and I made $1 billion in profits. That means my net profit margin is 10%. Last year, it was 15%. So even though I made a billion dollars, something seems to be off because my net profit margin is falling. And we're actually going to look at the margins, all of the margins for this. It's actually in the Excel sheet that I sent. Um, the guys that just came in, are you able to see, um, are you able to see the Excel sheet that, that's in the, um, the chat? Yes. Okay. Okay. Excellent. 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 I, I thought that would, uh, I would have to keep sending it over, but that's good. Um, can we, oh, Okima said no. All right. I'll resend. Matty said, can we please go through financial ratios that are more suited to analyze certain companies? Certainly, because that's definitely important when it comes down to ratios. And you will see that. Give me a second. Let me just um, send, the, send the sheet real quick. All right, I'm sending it now, guys. It should, should pop up in the chat anytime, at any moment. So you know what, since Matthew said that, I'm gonna share. Some of these margins are more suitable to some companies than others. And when we go through the valuation section, you're going to realize how important that is. All right, so we spoke about financial ratios. Oh, yes. So. We have income um, statement ratios that are more geared towards profitability. Um, at, I, I realize that in Jamaica, we focus a lot on net income. Once the company makes more money than it did last year, we focus a lot on that, right? And that is important, you know. That is important. If you guys watch international news and, and listen to international analysts talk, um, you will hear them talk about uh, earning surprise, right? A surprise meaning naturally what it is. If you wait, if 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 I walk in our room and I expect it to be alone in my house, and a man jump up and say, "Bugu waga waga," I'm surprised. So in earnings, when it comes down to financials, the, there's a certain number that people expect, or a certain um, income that people expect the company to make. And then if they go over that amount, then wow, I'm surprised. This is this is a good surprise. And if it's below that amount, it 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 um it's it's usually it's usually depending on the situation, a bad thing. And of note, 
the expectation of earnings may be higher than this than this than the period last year. So let's say for 2020, you expect um, creamy. Let's use creamy since we're going to analyze it to make 100 million. Last year they made 90 million. 100 million is more than 90. So you already expect them to be last year. If they come for 2020 and release their financial as that and they made 95, that would not necessarily um, be, be a, a, a good thing, even though it's higher than the period before, right? So just, just, just introducing you to that. Though when you're in international markets now, and I know, and I know quite a few other guys on this, on, on this uh, meeting, I'm very into finance, even though even the guys that don't work in finance, which is really good. And you will realize that overseas analysts, a matter of fact, they have profitability there, but they focus a lot on balance sheet. They focus a lot on your cash. So you will hear cash a lot, cash from operations. Uh, you, Apple has $100 billion worth of cash there. You'll hear debt equity or leverage you hear words such as solvency, and I'll just allow Julian to just briefly explain. Uh, you know, Julian can either write a book or a page. You know? I'm very talented. So, 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 Julian, if you can briefly explain what is um, solvency and what is liquidity, so and then we'll, we'll move on. Okay, so solvency is the company's ability to cover its liabilities with its assets or its resources. And those, those liabilities are typically extending past the year. So when we're talking about having, a posit having positive equity, that's a sign of being solvent. But when you're insolvent, it's a situation where liabilities surpass your assets, right? You don't want a situation like that. And I'll just talk an interesting case study here. So recently I was looking at McDonald's and McDonald's is still the largest fast food chain in the world. And it has so many branches and it's generating so much revenue and so much profit. But they're insolvent. Their liability surpasses their, um, their, their, their assets. And a lot of people don't know that. So if you're going to buy McDonald's stock, you should know that the, 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 <laughs> the book value of the stock is negative. So that's an example of an insolvent company. Um, but, no. but Julian, and, and since I make that point, hold on. So insolvency don't mean say as soon as it turn negative, the CEO come downstairs and lock the doors and walk with the company mash up, right? That's right, right. Yeah. It can be it can be for a period, it can be for specific reasons. It could be that you're paying so many dividends back to back that it depletes your equity base. Because remember, you're no, they haven't always been insolvent. They've been insolvent for about four or five years now. In their several years of operation, they've been in business for about 30 years, but they've had some management issues combined with some stress around intense competition in their space and the pressure also to pay out a continuous dividend to their shareholders. Those are some of the major drivers that drove them into insolvency, but they can turn around with certain strategic um, revisions. But I won't get into that. I won't stray from that. Tonight is cream is night. So... We're talking about liquidity. Liquidity is more short term now. So we're talking about current assets and current liabilities and the company's ability to take care of its obligations with, that are due within a year or less, or another way of looking at it, within one operating cycle, right? And an operating cycle might go a little bit over a year, but typically it's talking about the financial year. But solvency is more dealing with a longer time span. So they're the same thing in principle, but one is dealing with a shorter period, which is liquidity, and a longer period is dealing with solvency. Okay. okay. You know, you just pop up, Julian, and um, sorry, where I worked the whole day, so my some some head out of it. Do we have a local case of a company that that has been that was insolvent for a while? Um, they are, you know, they just don't come to mind immediately. But there are quite I a few. In sweet sweet river. Yeah, sweet river, um, definitely. Was, yeah, man, they, they they were insolvent. Yeah, man. Um, um, C2W, C2W music too. and Terrible. well, those two examples kind of perfect. Yeah, those companies <laughs> don't exist. I mean, they, those companies don't exist anymore. Yeah, uh, wait, wait, Sweet River, they sold off their assets to somebody. 
Yeah, um, I believe so. Believe. Yeah, man, they sold off their their assets. It's just that I haven't heard anything about. Anyways, moving on. Yeah. And I think, yeah. So let's go. All right. So you guys can open your Excel sheets. Um, so you can listen to a start, but you can just open the Excel sheet that I just sent. So on the Excel sheet, and I'm going to actually bring up the Excel sheet on mine, but we're just looking at this now. This is the consolidated income statement for Creamy. Um, so before we dive in, what I like to do, and I, again, Julian may be different, Jeremy may be different, Monica, Chike, everybody, Dean, you may be different from me. But what I do is when I enter my numbers, I like to just sit down and take a look at it, right? What, what am I seeing here just from the numbers, right? So one of the first things I, I look on is, well, clearly sales or revenue here. And I look where revenue was and where it is. So this is kind of what we call, uh, well, I call eyeballing, or we can have a more formal word for it, um, trend analysis. So Matthew said that revenue, revenue is down uh, in nine months, 2019. Oh, and this is funny. Let, let me explain this first. So cream is here in is February, right, Julian? Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, cream is here in is, is February. So when you see 2020 here, it's actually February 2020. So we at Creamy would have just finished their quote unquote February 2021 year. I thought that would have been a bit confusing. So I just kept it at. So nine month 2019 is actually for the previous um, 2020 year. So, all right, Matthew's giving us some insights. Matthew said that the nine month is down, hold on. Nine month 2019 is down compared to 2020. But remember, you have to compare apples and oranges. So 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 are all what, 12 month periods, right? Nine month 2019 is only nine months. So if we compare this column with this column, it will kind of be, you know, comparing them unfairly. But why we, and, and why I kind of left out the colors here is because we should compare nine month 2020 to nine month 2019. So for nine month 2020, you, I realize that sales is, sales is up, right? Um, what else do I see? And guys, I deliberately never went into creamy in detail because I wanted to do that on, on, on here. Um, the gross profits clearly are up. Um, that's a good thing. How does it look over the years? So the first thing I can see is that Creamy was doing very well in terms of gross profits up until 2018. In 2018, gross profits fell from 462 million to 420 million. So it fell from there. Um, and let's look down in 2018. So clearly something happened in 2018, right? And I am willing to bet, oh, but you realize this? Look at the numbers. And guys, this is what me call eyeballing. We have 653, 737, fine, increase. 685, so this is volatile. So clearly they have an input. The cost of sales is what you use to make your product. So for ice cream, I think Creamy said one of their major inputs is, uh, milk powder, right? Yeah, milk they said powder. That one of, yeah, one of their major inputs is milk powder. So they said that when the price of milk powder on the international market increases, then being a small player, it does affect them. So, and that's just me speculating. So at 685 to 752, so kind of back in the 700 region, but you realize in 2018, this jumped to, jumped to 953. So this stands out to me, but you realize because this jumps to 953, gross profits are down to 420. Operating profit fell to 101. Profit before tax fell to 90. And overall net profits fell to 
90. Also, another thing that stands out to me is the empty, is the empty lines. So Matthew said that there's no other operating income for 2020 as yet. Okay. Um, what I am seeing all as well is that the taxes, for some of these years, cream paid no taxes. Uh, anybody know why? Remember we're learning with, with each other, you know. Juno Market Company. Yes. I don't know who said that, but yes. So for Juno Market Companies, and I'm... I, I don't like to assume that people know things, so I'll say it even though you might very well know. Hey, Trevor and go and put on a black shirt with all a, a, a silver in silver chain. Trevor, yeah. <laughs> I had on the same thing. Spillman <laughs> perfume from right so. Marketing. All right. So for Juno Market Companies, in your first five years of of, of, of being listed you um, get a tax remission or you don't pay 100% of, oh, see, Matthew, Matthew Premier, Matthew, Matthew Sharp, you know. So, yeah, um, for the first five years, you don't pay any taxes and for the, and they listed in mid-2013, I believe. And for the next five years, you only pay 50% of your corporate income tax. Um, and you have to stay up. Some people don't know this. The company, even when they reach the 10 year mark and they start paying full taxes, the company has to stay listed for five more years. So if they come off the market before on overall 15 years, they have to pay um, back the tax liability or the taxes that they would have um, foregone from being on the junior market. I'm sure no company wants to add up all of that and pay that one time. You know, so this serves as an incentive for, for companies to listen on the market. And as you guys would have seen, it has really worked. All right, so let's open the, let's, let's open the sheet. Oh, so. Cost of sales, very often, not be so clear on what it is, but cost of sales most of the time links back to inventory. So the difference between the revenues, which is the sales, and the cost of inventory can be seen as your trading spread. Trading is just talking about sales. So the difference between what you paid for the inventory and what you sold it for. So that's your trading spread. So if you see that a business has a negative trading spread, we'll call that cash burn. Um, it's just a term. So that, some of the whoever run the business they need to come out of business. <laughs> or, or, or you must buy something. Or you must buy something for ten dollar and sell it for nine. Even though it's possible. Yeah, in it times where yeah, in a, times where you have channel. to sell. In times where you have to sell. So R Dean says, repeat please, I didn't get the full tax info. No problem. So for the first five, um, I think. Um, Chike wants you to repeat, Julian. So, so let, let me just tell Ardine this. So for the first five years, when a company lists on the junior market, so the most recent company is Tropical Battery, right? So Tropical Battery listed on the junior market late last year. That means that up to late 2025, they don't pay, um, no comment, Matthew, they don't pay 100% of their corporate income tax, right? For the next five years, means that between 2025 and 2030, they only pay 50% of their corporate income tax. And every year after 2030, as long as they stay listed, uh, well, every year after 2030, they just pay a normal income tax, which for non-regulated companies, 25% of your income. Um, she asks you to rewind. Okay, I was saying that many times the cost of sales has a lot to do with the inventory. So let's say our inventory cost us $2 and we sold the product for $5. So the trading spread would be $3. And that would be the gross profit. That's pretty much it. So we just call it the trading spread. And I really need to watch that carefully because if the trading spread is getting thinner, it could have a lot to do with the supply chain issues. So we know that 
you have businesses that have challenges with their supply chains because of COVID. So you should say, well, I'm not sure. But you could see an instance where gross profit margins are narrowing a little bit. Some people might have taken a hit. Uh, they might not have been able to pass on all of those costs over to their consumers immediately in the short term. So they might take a hit and they might say gross profit margins um, decline a little bit. But it's very good to watch a trading spread. And many times when the trading spread is negative or when the gross profit is negative, it's referred to as cash burn. Cash burn is a deeper concept, but for businesses that have just begun, for example, startups, particularly many of the tech companies in the US, when there's a sustained period of negative gross profit, it's referred to as cash burn because the business hasn't been able to cross that hurdle just yet. Yeah. So, um, going back to, you know, actually, actually, really, I uh, watch the thing, you know, she see it. So, I actually get the eyeballing thing. Ashley is saying, if they listed in 2013, how comes they paid taxes in 2016 and 2014? So, more than likely, oh, um, Jeremy, and, Jeremy and had a question. More than likely, the, the taxes that are in 2014 were some form of deferred taxes um, that they already on their, uh, had on their balance sheet to pay. Um, the tax in 2016, though, is suspect. So, uh, boy, I, I don't usually see deferred taxes so far into uh, after listing. But what may have happened, that, and it's just 56,000. Um, well, call it 57,000. What may have happened is that they had some corporate activity that, that had to be taxed that fell outside of the, of, of the tax regime that they have on the junior market. Um, most recently, I was analyzing a company a listed company, junior market. And no, it's, it's, it's actually not junior market. So it, it's a company that falls below the threshold. And they had exactly $60,000 in, in tax expense. And then I remember that, oh, the minimum business tax was $60,000 for a while, you know, until um, Santa Clark um, got rid of that. So thanks for that question, Ashley. So this is eyeballing. So you realize we're not really getting we're not getting at the financial statements yet, you know. So this is this is a financial statement that I have um, up. So just going through, we have the balance sheet, um, which is next, which your current your non-current assets are your fixed assets, your current assets, um, your current liabilities. So this is the balance sheet, and guys, I know. For, for people that get flustered with numbers, don't worry. Remember, you can always unmute and ask any questions that you want to ask. Um, the equity base of the business is um, a little over 800 million. Equity base has been increasing. So this is what I do. I enter my numbers and then I scroll through the sheet, right? Another thing that I do um, is I have a standard sheet that just can, does all of my charts. Right, and this is here. So sometimes I can look on the numbers and pick up trends, and sometimes I actually need to see the trend on a chart. So you realize what we were saying about sales a while ago. So this blue um, chart over here is sales. Let me let me make it a little bigger. Top top left hand corner, move from eight fifty six. This is a good sign, by the way. What this is saying is that since listing, Creamy has managed to increase its sales every single year since, since listing. And also, it has increased its sales over the last, over the nine month period. Matthew said that even though revenues and gross profits were up, it didn't translate to net profits. Ah. So net profits, do you have a template for this? A template, what do you mean, Matthew? I think he was referring to the Excel sheet. Oh, yeah, man, I, I sent it. I sent it. I sent it to you, man, Matthew. Check, 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 the, check the, the chat. All right. So, but I want to point out something. Where is net profits? 
So look at net profits here. So you guys realize that even though sales has been increasing consistently on the dot every year, they have done very well to sell creamy. When you reach down here, you realize that their net profits, firstly, these sales are increasing in relatively decent increments. So you realize when I start calculating, nothing yet, you know, we're just looking. They are increasing in relatively decent increments. However, when you reach the net profits, it jumps. Jump from 56 to 164. Small increment. Then dropped materially in 2018. Then has continued to fall to 2020. And then since the nine-month period, or well, since last year, they've actually started to improve. So what this tells me is that sales is certainly not the problem. The problem is with their expenses. So somewhere, the only, the major line item between revenues and profits is expenses. So right? that would speak to their efficiency then, Simon? Yes, that would speak, that, that would help to speak to how efficiently they are producing their goods. Now, Julian was talking about gross profits and cash burn. You realize that the, the revenues don't look like the gross profits either? And guys, as I said, we're not calculating nothing yet, but just look. It's almost like a ladder. You know, somebody with a bad foot like mine could have climbed up this ladder. However, when you reach over to the gross profit, I remember where the gross profit is, guys. Look at your sheet. The gross profit is just two lines away. So revenue minus cost of sales equals to gross profit. You realize how different it looks? Just, just the look. I could climb up this, but then I forgot to jump up this. This is okay. I forgot to step down, up, up, up. And you realize the gross profit margin, which is total gross profits as a percentage of total sales, increased, which, which, which is reflected in the increase in um, total gross profits but it has actually been falling. It fell consistently for two years, went up in one, and you can call this relatively flat because when you move it to a small place, it's going to be relatively flat in, in 2020. So these are all things that we want to know what happened in the financial analysis. All right, any questions? So that's the, that's the eyeballing and the trend analysis. Oh, Matthew, Matthew said, oh, a template, template oh, for other, other types, of, types of companies. What do you mean like real estate? No, no, Matthew, you see, boy, probably, probably I could do something like that, but you see me like things the hard way. So I, and this is very old fashioned. I like to enter my numbers from scratch. Julian may know this. But like for you sit down and type in my numbers then. Because when I sit and type in my numbers, it's like, my, this is going to sound very nerdy. It's like me, I feel the pulse of the business. So when I type in 855 and then type in 1012, I say, wait, that's a big jump. Then I type in 5000, I say, oh, whoa, this doesn't look right. Something wrong right or so. So I like to, no, I'm not a nerd, Dean. <laughs> yes, yeah, Simon, and sometimes when you have those moments, you have to look twice and say, I had them a trick me whole on. What just happened a while ago? Yeah, man. So it's I like like to... you, you, you just pick it up. It's like a bulb. Yeah. So if I'm doing this sheet for, let's say, a different type of company, First Rock or QWI, I will enter, I will re-enter all of these numbers. And, well, I've been doing it for a while now. So this entire sheet can take me two hours. Um, for somebody that just does it, it can probably take a couple of days. Um, but so I sit down and enter my numbers and I recalculate all of the ratios. Now, the ratios are down here. I want, oh, five hours for chicken. Chicken, no worry, man. Trust me. It all get faster. And you see, the beauty of it is when you create a sheet for creamy, like how me sending on this sheet now, which is very good, by the way, you not have to do another sheet for creamy. All you have to do is actually enter creamy numbers in this exact sheet. 
And here's a trick. For companies, for manufacturing and distribution companies, their, their income statement, the structure of them, um, are, are, are usually the, the same. Meaning that if you take up this sheet, I actually did this sheet on top of Wisinko, all you would have to do is just enter Wisinko's numbers and it will calculate everything. Jeremy, you are too much, man. Um, <laughs> so this is like a close ver version to a template, though, because you have a sheet that, that is linking all ratios. Um, it is linking all project projections, and it is linking the charts. So if you are really, you know, if you want to punch in the, the numbers for an, another firm, then it should be fairly easy to replicate e even the same charts. We know the revenue got the same place, the gross profit, the net profit, and it should be easy to rep um, replicate the charts. It sounds like Trevor and I go use my sheet. <laughs> well, I have mine, you know, which looks quite nice. <laughs> All right, Trevor. So, so. I mean, Jermaine, whenever I, I don't really do public companies much anymore, um, I'm not in research anymore. So I actually don't do this much. I do it mostly with private companies Soto brag. Um, and private structures. So, so to brag. It's okay, Simon. No, no. It's, it's just I'm saying I, I wouldn't be doing this regular. So I wouldn't do this for our first work. I wouldn't do it for analytic companies. All right. So come look at the ratios. Guys, I personally think, well, I think this is a fact. The ratios tell you a lot more than the numbers will. So the numbers can look very rosy, you know. The numbers can look rosy and a man will throw it in front of you and say, yo, I make a billion dollars. And you say, wow, you make a billion dollars in profit. But when you look at him, um, him ratios them, him ROE is 3%. No, bro. With your equity base, you need to make more money, right? Um, so if you look at these, and these, this is just a select group of ratios, guys. I could have done more. Um, there are actually a lot more ratios. These are just some of the, mains, the main ones that, that, that I focus on. If you unhide the columns, I, I hit some of the columns. If you unhide them, you will see the rest of the ratios, right? I didn't calculate, it, calculate them. Um, so, if you look at ROE, now guys, this is where we're going to move a bit fast now. So, ROE is really just net income divided by total equity. So, what Julian mentioned with the belly of the business or your net worth, it is saying, what is the total, what, how much profit did you make this year as a percentage of your equity base, as a percentage of the value of the assets that you have. The higher that number is, the better. However, in some cases, the number can be either artificially high or artificially low. Artificially high, the best example is um, smoking, careers, right? Careers has a very small equity base because they pay out most of their money in dividends. Because they have a small equity base, their RO is very high. Right, and for companies that are asset rich, they have a lot of assets, or they are very um, so they have a lot of assets relative to the amount of um, liabilities that they have. Their equity base will be much larger and their ROE much smaller. So, if you look on um, Creamy's ROE right here, you realize that company that go on with things, man. So, you have a ROE in 2014 of 15%. Then it jumped to 22%, then 45%. This is a big jump. So when I'm doing my numbers, this is something that I would highlight, right? 22 to 45 is a big jump. Oh, um, Chika says he likes to look at the operating margin. Yes, the operating margin is one of my important ones as well. It dropped to 34%. 34%. And you realize Creamy's ROE has consistently declined to 7.5% in 2020. 
Now, we would have seen that they've been making less money. So that is explained here. Pardine, you're, you're talking to me? You're muted. Okay. But you realize that for 20, for the, for the current financial year, or the one that, yeah, the current financial year, their ROE went up. Now, cream is management, and we're going to look into it, but cream is management is saying, look, ice cream is comfort food. So people stay home in the pandemic. He was very honest and said, look, we did actually expect things to go down, but it looked like people like to eat ice cream when they're home with their loved ones for comfort, you know? So people have been buying more ice cream. So, so I think the kids are a big factor too. Ah, that so remember the kids are at, the kids are at home. Mm -hmm. So you know, oh, you know, daddy, I want ice cream. You know, it's a different thing. You just say, no man, none for me. But if you look at that and look funny, you know, you have to go in at the wallet. All right, Julian. So we know say so your daughter go spoil. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, another thing too, as you said, that Julian, what just popped up is that Creamy has a very large distribution net network. So whereas Devon House Ice Cream, which is owned by the same people but private, they have a, phys a very popular physical location and they have other locations um, around Jamaica. Cream's distribution network is in, um, sorry guys, it's not just my childhood name for them. Um, they, they, they creamy them. Uh, actually, a creepy call them. A me alone call them creamy. The man they may ride around on the bike. With the ice cream? No, you used to call it for. Uh, we used to call Fudgy. it Fudgy. Yeah, Fudgy. Yeah. You remember Fudgy? <laughs> yeah, man. Oh, I, yeah, I see more. I see trucks more now, though. Not as many bikes. No, man. We still see. We still see bikes are going to the community, but I, I'm mostly some old man. So it's like old man. Them I keep it. The distribution network. Yeah, they are yeah, live, yeah, yeah. You know. So I was yeah. thinking that. That's a way that they can support that those things support cream is profitability in a pandemic because you don't have to, for some people, you don't have to leave your house, right? Um, I realized, ah, somebody just said it. Scoops, which is Devon House, has actually realized that there was, the pandemic never really worked much with their model because their model, you came into the store. So they have a truck, and the truck has been going out a lot more, but Matthew said uptown that. Matthew said that the uptown. So Julian said the... Yeah, Matthew, Julian loud city, me Yeah, Julian said the Devon House truck them, you know. But me said the cream, the fudge them. You know? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right. So these are profitability um, based ratios. So the gross margin has increased, 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 boom, fall again. So 2018 was a big year. So we'll have a look upon 2018. Um, and it's about 33, 34%, which is actually better than it was in 2018. Another thing that we'll look on is, Julian had mentioned what we call leverage ratios. So a leverage ratio, total debt to equity. So this is debt to EBITDA, sorry. This is the total amount of debt that a company has relative to its EBITDA. EBITDA, if you don't know, guys, is earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. So this is your operating profit before you make an account for depreciation and before you pay debt holders. This is important to debt holders mostly because this is the money that you pay them from. Right? So equity holders care more about these things up here, so. And this is just a fact. I mean, there are some equity holders that look on leverage, but equity holders just want to say, regardless of whatever leverage you make, some of them, you yeah, make more ROE. So if your leverage or your debt is increasing, but the returns that equity holders make, which is the ROE, is not increasing, then equity holders in our, 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 our say, look, this is problematic, right? And 
this ratio, so the rest of these ratios are just um, leverage based ratios. Um, and they can be used for sub, they're actually solvent, solvency ratios. Up here, we have liquidity ratios. Remember, when we say liquidity, you talk about liquid, you think about water, you think about cash, right? This is the raw cash. Well, not literally, of course. So, cash on the people in bank account that they have. This is the cash that you can go to Creamy's bank account any day and sit there. Or they have something called cash equivalents. Cash equivalents is actually literally what, it's, what, what the word says. These are things that are not necessarily cash, but they can act like cash because you have access to them. So one of those things may be a certificate of deposit, for example, right? A certificate of deposit, it's relatively, some of them is relatively short term and you can break that whenever you want, right? In, in our world, we have what we call repos and repos are short term and they are cash like, right? It's as good as having cash, but not the exact thing. So we actually yeah, going to see these as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So we're actually going to go into um, the liquidity, but just from eyeing it, you realize liquidity peaked again. Actually, liquidity peaked before 2017. In 2018, and it fell to 1.32, which is the current ratio. Now, the current ratio, Trevon, um, I don't know if you want to take that one. I think Trevon, I hear me. Trevon, you're on mute. All right, yeah. So, as Simon said, so these ratios here basically shows the liquidity of the business and basically it's when we speak about liquidity we speak more about short term right and when we speak about sol solvency we speak more about long term right so the current ratio is the current assets divided by your current liabilities right so from your cash, your cash equivalents um, and your current assets, your receivables, how much time can it cover your short-term liabilities, which are your current liabilities? And re remember that your current liabilities are li liabilities that, that are due in 12 months or less, right? So anything that is due in the short term. So naturally, you want a current ratio that is above one. Below one so suggests that with your current assets, you cannot cover your short term obligations. So that speaks to the current ratio. The Quick ratio, it's your current as assets, but we have stripped out our inventory, right? So we use our current assets and we strip out our inventory. Again, this shows the same thing. How can the current assets that I have, excluding my inventory, cover my short-term obligations. So the quick ratio though, it strips out uh, an, an it strips out a current assets that, that's not as easily converted to cash. It's inventory, right? And if you want to get rid of it, then you would need to sell it. So that covers the quick ratio. Again, you would rather it be more than one than less, as less su suggests that you cannot cover your short-term obligations. The cash ratio, no. The cash ratio, literally, and Simon can confirm, it's literally the cash and cash equivalents and like marketable securities. Right, Simon? Yeah. yeah, yeah so it's the cash and cash equivalents and marketable securities 
divided by your current liabilities. So the story is the, is the same. We want to check or we want to see if based on our most liquid current asset, which is cash, can we cover our short-term obliga obligations? So that's how we look at our liquidity ratios, which is the current ratio, the quick ratio, and our cash ratio. And, and a good way to look at it as well, guys, is it, it's, it's good to say it in order, current, quick, and then cash, because the quick ratio is a stronger measure of liquidity than the current ratio. Because remember, as Trevon mentioned, you know, you want to be able to sell these assets and pay your current liabilities. Now, think about Fontana. Fontana has a few very big pharmacies. Matter of fact, I think there are past pharmacies now, um, particularly Waterloo. For, for if, let's say, Fontana's current liabilities, the people at the O, so we want to own it tomorrow. It is very unlikely that Fontana would be able to go into the and sell all of their inventory, meaning everything on the shelves. Very unlikely. Creamy couldn't do that either. So that's why they came up with the quick ratio. And then you have the cash ratio, which is raw cash. The higher it is, the better. However, who can tell me why, not you, Julian Archer who can tell me why a high cash ratio may be a bad thing as well. Having too much cash. I'm going to take a guess at it, Simon. Um, having too much cash means you're not distributing it properly throughout the business, basically. Yeah. I know, Chica, I know you're not guessing. You, know. you, see, you see, I saw Chica act when he's humble, you know. He's <laughs> yeah, him, him, him humble, you know. Ah, so I, I like a balance. That's me. So I don't like to see when your cash ratio is too low, um, 0 0.01 times. But I don't like to see when your cash ratio, your cash, the amount of cash that you have covers your current liabilities by two, three times, which means you have two, three times the amount of cash that you need to cover your current liabilities. Um, this to me, says that, look, pay me a dividend. You don't need it, so me need it. Two, buy a company. Give us, give us the cash. Yeah, give, give me the cash since you don't want it. I'm my company, you know. Two, use the cash and do something. Buy some more ice cream. And, I'm not talking about cream. I'm just talking generally. Buy some more ice cream for broilers. If it was broilers, buy some more chicken for sell, man. Or build a new factory or something. However, boy... Jermaine, you pray at me. Another question. Why, especially, no, I'm not going to get Why is having a high cash ratio or a decent cash ratio or liquidity ratio important in times like these, in times when you're in trouble? I wonder if Chike won't guess again. Guess. I missed that one. Sorry, I have to repeat it. So sorry. No, I was, I was, I was asking. Well, the guys, the guys primed you. But I was asking, why is it? Why is why is a high cash ratio or a high level of liquidity overall a good thing in bad times? Because you can either make you can either in bad times, which I said it, I said it before. Once you have cash in bad times, it means you can survive. And also, as you run the corner, you are able to mobilize and make investments faster than everybody else. Yeah. Yeah, boy, it's very... Let me tell you. You see some of them hotel here? Yes, them wish them did have some cash right now. Because you see that working, the daily cash for the mafia burn, because they still have to pay groundsmen. They still have to tidy the rooms, because, I mean, once you don't... Once the rooms stay a certain way too long, you still have to, you you're probably end up doing more work, right? Um, they have to take care of the property, the managers, the full-time staff may still get paid. These what we call working capital things still need to get done. Somebody said it actually. Um, it provides a safety net that you can draw down on. 
very important. So in bad times like now, Julian may, you know, Julian is a nice Christian. Here. So Julian has a company and him have 50 employees. And COVID happened, he's a restaurant and Julian said, look, I am not going to send home my employees. I have a lot of cash in the business. They are the ones that helped me to build that cash in the first place. So hear what? You guys can come in and the best I can do is give you a half salary, right? And a lot of businesses actually did that. Another part, somebody said it so they can survive. Vlad said it's time to acquire small businesses. You know, this is unfortunate, but you see in times of trouble, bad companies are poorly run companies. They suffer the most, right? You, when you have a lot of cash sitting on, you can start shopping. So let's say when COVID started, right, and the market went down by 20%, within over that one month period, GK had $20 million put, put down, right? When GK said the crisis happened, GK said, eh, but this nice man. So everybody else a ball start and position. I say, everybody else a ball and I say, oh, me have to sell this, me have to sell, and GK said, yes. Buy time, <laughs> buy time. Chica just spend the twenty million dollar, right? Oh, Jeremy and said Chica is conservative, so I have to use Trevon. <laughs> Would a share buyback be one of the reasons too? Hmm. So in times when you have a lot of cash, yeah, you can use that cash and 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 buy back shares to improve your um, EPS. So Jermaine says she would, would spend one million and save the nineteen million. She can have too much money at the bank, man. And the All savings right. issue then I look to, you know? Yeah, man. Oh, yes. So, so you work... see that sorry, Trevon. No, I just noticed that we don't have working capital there. So working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. Oh yeah. Current yes, assets yes. minus current liabilities. So, so working, working capital, capital yes. Yeah. yeah, man. Very important. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, thanks for that, Julian. Um, I didn't know, I think it may be in one of these columns, but I'm not sure. Actually, I doubt it. So thanks for that one. So cash, boy, guys, you see how finance weird? There's no, there's no scenario where you can say, oh, cash is always a good thing. Too much cash is always a good thing. The more, the better. No, then this is why you have to understand it. There are times when a lot of cash is good, Right? It's a good thing. And there are times when a lot of cash is not necessarily a good thing. It means that you as a manager, you're probably too conservative like Chike. You know? And another thing, you might see some companies, what some companies do, how you can pick up how some companies are conservative. Look, you can look on a company's balance sheet and, touch, and, and know how their board of directors is, you know? You see, if a company... Let's say you manufacture watches, right? That's your business. You manufacture watch. So your balance sheet should really be an inventory of watches and a reasonable amount of cash. They have companies that have total assets of, let's say, a billion dollars. But they have 300 million dollars invested in an equity account or in a money mark, in an investment, like actual investment. So they are saying, look, boy, that $300 million, we have it on. We can't really deploy it now. So we're going to put it in and put it in an investment account. It's not necessarily a bad thing either. If they don't see any opportunities in the market, they have to try to make some other income. And that's usually what's in finance income or other income on the balance sheet. All right. So we've eyeballed a lot. We eyeballed for one hour, for half an hour, but eyeballing is good, trust me. I don't feel bad about it. So if you guys click the formulas in the sheets, in the in the Excel sheet, you'll actually see how these are calculated. Um, return on equity, just a note. Sometimes different people will calculate ROE, particularly what we call mixed ratios. So mixed ratios are ratios that have one element from, an, from one financial statement and another element from another financial statement. So it's usually 
the income statement and the balance sheet. Well, and let me just explain quickly, half a page, three sentence, all right, five sentence. So the, the income statement is done over a period of time. So the, the, what you're looking at for Creamy is 12 months of income. However, the balance sheet figures are done as at the last day of that period, right? So it's like comparing something that happened over a period of time to something that only happened on a day. So what we usually do is find the average of the balance sheet figures from the start and the end of the period. So if you double click the ROE, you should see average of the two figures there. Some people just keep it at the last, the last figure, it's not wrong. It's just how you have to say exactly how you calculate it. Um, oh, no, man, it's, 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 it's not wrong, man. It's not wrong. No, man. So, so, so what happened to Chike and why we do that? And I would say it's best, best practice. And let me explain why. There are certain businesses that change materially in one year. And I just want to say Barita is one of those businesses. So you will have a business that started the year at $6 billion in equity. But the end year financial year with $30 billion in equity. If you use the $30 billion, your ROE is going to be very low and it may not completely reflect what happened in the business over the period. So what some analysts do is that they average it between how it started and how it ended. Matter of fact, some analysts, and I, I don't think I agree with this one, use the opening figure rather than the closing figure. Opening just means the last figure from the last period. So we spoke about these. Um, return on assets is really just the the amount of income that your assets are able to generate. The higher, the better. All right? Um, Simon, Simon. Yeah, Trevor. So before, um, before you move, move on here, so there, there's a rule of thumb that I personally use whenever I am doing the ratios, right? And you see, from once I am taking figures from the income statement and the balance sheet, I always find the average on the balance sheet. So from one time work from, so from once that ratio is say using the net income. So we know that the return on equity, as you just said, is the net income divided by your shareholders equity, right? From I, I know that the, share, the shareholders' ec equity is on my balance sheet. So from one because remember, the balance sheet is at a period, right? So we know that the balance sheet is as at a particular P period, while the income sta statement is over a period of, of time, right? So what I do is always find the average on the balance sheet when I am doing my ratios. Okay. All right, good, good rule of thumb, um, Trevon. I just want to point out, I saw one more thing. One of the, the, the best leverage ratios, somebody asks, you know, and I'm going to just mention the ratios that I like to look on. So clearly ROE is one, operating margin, profit margin. I love to look at the debt to equity. The debt to equity shows me how leveraged the business is, how much relative debt do they have, and it also shows me how much debt they can take on. So this is actually very good. The higher this is, it's not necessarily good if it gets too high. It started very high, so there are a lot of debt, well, more debt relatively, and over the period of time, this ratio has fallen from 66%, or it can be represented as 0.66, but 
and has fallen to what it is currently at 20%. This is a good thing. So when in investment banking, when we're looking at whether a company can raise debt or issue a bond, this is one of the things that we, that we look on. So we can say, oh, the 20% is low, man. We can raise so much debt that we increase this back to 60% and you will still be safe, right? So that's, that's, that's one of the things um, that we look at. And I mean, just, just looking at this, more than likely it's because as the business grew over time and made more money, the equity base got larger and larger. So the relative debt to equity got smaller and smaller. Again, let me know if you have any questions. So we looked at this already. I already, we already spoke about low ratios and high ratios. Um, we spoke about the observations, the cash flow statement. As I said, the cash flow statement just shows the, the, the amount of cash um, that's going in and coming out of the business. Briefly, it has three main parts. My favorite line, and so being personal here, is the cash from operating act activities. In globally, global analysts look a lot on cash from operating activities. What this says, and you know I like accountants, then they need to create, well, sometime, then they need to create a special word for this. Cash provided by operating activities. Them try to be very clear. So this is the cash that the business makes from actually um, doing what they do. So if you sell watch, this is the amount of cash that comes out of your watch business. Of course, the higher the better. So you realize they started at 31, they went up to a higher 225. Start, they fell in 2017, went above 28, fell. So this is, this is kind of going up and down, up and down, right? I think I did this in the in the in the charts. Well, I hope I did it. Yeah, I did it. So you realize it's it's up, boom, down, up, down, up. And we're going to see why this may or may not be a good thing when we start the valuation. There is investing activities. Oops. So the cash from operating activity shows this is the amount of cash. Sorry, Chike. Okay, yeah, smooth trend is ideal, but boy, trust me, where Jamaican companies stay, I, actually, I just want it to be positive. <laughs> I mean, there are Jamaican companies that, because Jamaican companies, I realize, they don't manage, they don't focus on their cash flow a lot. They focus on profits. Now, American companies, they, them, them do cash flow management, right? Them do it down to a T. So some American companies, you always see them with a smooth trend. Um, but companies, in my opinion, companies that focus a lot on, on cash flows um, should be better off in COVID because cash is actually something where you can take up and help with your working capital. So investing activities is what did I use the cash to do? You realize here it says purchase of property, plant and equipment. So in 2020, they made $233 million in operating cash. But they, and they spent 161 million dollars to purchase um, equipment, land, um, fixed assets. For that period, they also paid out 18 million dollars in dividends and they paid out 30 million dollars in loans. They realized that the 233 is more than the 161, right? So them have money left. Them have about um, 70 million dollars left. So out of that 70 odd million dollars, they paid, um, they paid out 48 million dollars overall. 
so they ended up with a net positive cash flow. It, I think it should be on your Excel sheet. It's, it's not here, not on the PowerPoint, but it's in the Excel sheet. I want to bring you back to 2019 though. And this is a very, is an observation that I have with cash flows. And it's, it's something that can help you when, you when you're doing your analysis. You realize that the business only made 136 million in operating cash flows. However, the business invested 244 million. This means that they spent more cash than they had. There is only one thing that can happen. Well, there are a few things, but the major thing that comes after this without even looking below this, they must have done something to finance this. You, if I have a hundred dollars, if I have a hundred dollars, and I owe Julian and I buy a phone for $150, that $50 must come from somewhere, must. So without even looking below the line, I know that financing activities, something happened. I realize they borrowed a loan. So what's the deficit? The deficit up here is about 100 um, call it a hundred and several million, 106 several million. They borrowed a hundred million. So now them remember they still have a deficit now. No. So 107 minus a hundred, they still have seven million deficit. They repaid 19 million dollars and they repaid 18 million dollars, which means that. The deficit of several million dollars actually became a much larger deficit. So guys, as you realize, some of the line items, are, I kind of took, took them out. Um, but overall, if you add up these three things, 63, 244, and 136, this is still negative. So even though they borrowed a loan slash a debt or a bond, they still had a negative cash balance. What's the next thing that they can do? So Chika said that they can do a loan. Well, a loan, debt, and bond is really the same thing, just in different forms. Well, they're all debt. So what's the, oh, all right, all right. So remember, financing activities can be debt or equity. So Jeremy and rightly said, they could have done an APO, but we know that Cream never did an APO. So let's say that they can do an APO. What's another thing that they can do? So if you have, come and we're going to reason this out, you know. If you have $100 and you buy a phone for $150, you need $50. Um, no equity, guys. No equity. So they didn't do anything re-equity. That's a hint. You have a $50 deficit. The $50 must come from somewhere. You borrowed $30. The bank tell us them now in the no more. Come out of them bank. You still have a deficit of twenty dollars. Where can you go for that twenty dollars? Jermaine, as a married man, you should know this. <laughs> and it's not borrowing. I will know them borrow already. You take it from where you already have. Right? So you take it from what you already have. So you see, ah, uh, so you see that cash balance in the in the in the the cash balance in the balance sheet, that cash balance may go down. If they don't have enough cash, they would have to sell assets. And and guys, this is under the assumption that they did nothing in equity, right? Jermaine says, wife retained earnings cannot be touched. Trust me, Jermaine, I know. You see, you see Trevor and I laugh because he know too. I Ever have a yeah, Kadeen. Um, wouldn't they also take from um, investing activities that they have? Yes, so, so that's what I'm saying, you know. So outside of debt, which they already did, and we are deliberately excluding equity. So we're saying they didn't do anything equ equity, so they could have. There are only a few other things that they could do. They could take from cash, but let's say that they don't have enough cash. 
you need 20 and you only have five. What the next thing me would have, me have to do is sell me G-Shock watch. So they may sell assets. When you sell an asset, the proceeds from that asset appears in your cash used in investing activities. So perfectly correct, Kadikali. So you can sell an asset. Um, what, what else you can do? So you can, sell, you can do debt equity, take it from your cash up bank, you can sell an asset, you can sell an investment, uh, well, any asset, because an investment is still an asset. Um, yeah, so those are, those are really the, the universe of, of things. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you guys ever heard about distressed debt. Um, that's, that's when a company is in a position where you don't have anybody to borrow from, you don't have any cash, you can't sell your assets. So a man like Julian, big investment money, come to you and say, fine, I will lend you the money. But you have to give me an arm and a leg. Not literally, but figuratively. So Julian, I go say, sure, I'll give you the $20. But for that $20, I want 50% of your business. And I want the rights to be able to seize your BMW right to be able to seize all of the assets of the company etc right so that's a brief quick side note Sorry. all right guys yes Karin. oh no i was just saying it's not like um that show that, that what's it called shock tank or something like that where they want part of your business just by investing yeah and but but shark shark tank is like is more equity so what the guys at Shark Tank want to do is buy an equity stake in a business at the lowest possible price. So they're low ball you, right? Yeah, so guys, I know we're talking a lot of numbers. You can take a, take a, a two minutes and then we'll come back. We're going jumping into the valuation now. So we're, doing, we're going to do some forecasting and the valuation. I think we covered uh, a majority of the material so forecasting and valuation i'll take a two minutes get some water i don't have any break music yeah man thanks matthew and and matthew cheek you you guys have been very interactive so far uh, if, if anybody has any questions questions in a few minutes you can ask no free drinks yeah man um where do Jermaine just walk into your kitchen um, open the fridge. Get all the free. <laughs> you gotta get all the free. Oh, talking about free ice cream. I remember the first AGM for creamy that I went to. Um, and right outside, the man that must serve beer, lollipop, and them things. Them is like, this is what an AGM should be. Sweetie, lollipop, all of these things. But sorry, guys, we're online, so. None of that no. If you guys have any questions, you can ask me. So I don't have a really a question, but I would like to commend you on this Zoom because a lot of people don't take interest in this thing because they think it's boring. But so far, it's it's good. Like I like it. Come on, thanks, 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 Adin. I mean, I I I like to balance it. So I I don't want to be just a Jamaican investor. Um, I also don't just want to move with momentum. I, I like to look at value and fundamentals. So if, 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 if the Honda Civic is worth $2.3 million, you can't sell it to me for $4 million. Matter of fact, I want to buy it for, for less than 2.3. So I want to know what is the value of that Honda Civic, you know? Um, and I realize that in particular in our market, so, so participation in the market has increased a lot, significantly. Uh, I want to get the latest numbers from, from the stock exchange. Um, but a lot of the people that participate in the market now, small and large, I have a large cross-section. It's just somebody like, I remember when, when Wigton was going on, people come in and say, I want to invest in the, the, the wing team, the wing, the, the thing we got, you know, that little thing there. And we were like, you mean Wigton? 
Oh, yeah, man, that, 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 I saw the ad and it was good and, you know, I like it and I said, and then the, the, the whole team had to do the, this whole educational thing. So, I mean, that's, that's one of our biggest drives and we'll have the guys from Learn, Grow and Invest here um, that are also supporting on that front. Um, so, so, yeah, this is, this is just how we contribute. And this is something that Julian and Trevon do every day. Um, I want to say almost literally, they do it every day. It, it's their job. So, and I used to do every day. So, yeah, man, we really, we, we just want to spread the knowledge like butter. So we're going to jump into the evaluation in one minute. Let me get some water, you know, because I've been chatting all night. And I'm parched. <laughs> so the sessions are normally once per month and at Stocks on the Rocks we really look at this as a part of human development. A lot of times we talk about the sustainable development goals and economic development and economic development cannot happen without human development and a part of that is education and a big part of that in our opinion is financial education so this is our way of trying to contribute to human development in jamaica now we need to move away from the eat of food mentality that's my personal opinion because when you're in survival mode this is how you view things and you can miss out from what else is around you so that is our view that is our approach. We're very principle driven. And that is why we do what we do. That stocks on the rocks. We also take requests so people can DM topics that they want us to speak on. They can say it here. We take a note. Because it's not really for us. You know, it's really a way of trying to maximize value. Only for you, that is, to be specific. We should do a video comparing multiples of different stocks. Hmm. A video on ETFs. We're getting ideas, Simon, so maybe you can write them down. So getting feedback of what, what people want us to cover. A video on ETFs and a video on multiples looking at different stocks. You know, doing maybe like a peer analysis. Hmm. Okay. Simon, what do you use to track your portfolio? So you don't know. Yo, if you never know me there, so I chat. Excel. <laughs> Excel. So, yeah, I use a Excel. Yeah, I use a I use an Excel sheet. Um not fancy, not fancy to be honest. Honestly, I should have been doing more work on it, but actual work got more worky. But it it functions okay. Um Yeah, I, boy, when it's a customize, I make it sound like it's great, you know. Um, just a, it's just a, simple, just a simple Excel sheet, to be honest. Um, somebody asks, video comparing stocks. Um, oh, oh, you track your portfolio. Okay. You know, um, Okima, Randy has a good tool on his website, Every Mickle for tracking your portfolio. Um, I saw it and it's, it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. So it does help. I like Proven's app. Oh yes, Proven. Proven um, has a, their, their app tracks the portfolio. Trevon, Julian. Yes, it, yes it Okay, does. so 
we will we will feed the information back to the team. Thank you very much for that, Matthew. I appreciate that. Oh, sorry, I do have a. I mean, I don't want to talk my business in you know, about. I do have a promo portfolio. You know. Everybody have to start somewhere, Simon. Don't worry. No, but you know, proven just. I'm not gonna say, cause I'm not want to bias Julian. <laughs> I'm mean, not Julian and money different, you know. No Andrew by him first name. Yo, Andrew. We are the <laughs> crime. We are dealing with crime. Anyway, <laughs> I think we can start. Um, nothing beats it. Wait, no, but me need, me need to try this proof of thing, man. I be your commendations. Now I get. Wish you didn't have the $200,000 minimum. No comment. Um, Money Max. You know, there are a few other apps. I've been trying. Yeah, Money Max is very good. Yeah, so there is Money Max. Um, boy, I can't remember the others right now, to be honest. You have a next one by the name of My, My Money JA. My Money JA, a stock market update. Stop me. My Money JA is in data use, though. It was a few people. Oh, 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 it's a money man thing. Sorry, sorry, Hector. <laughs> all right, so Ricardo, Ricardo, all right, so I'll take Ricardo being back as, as the prompt to start. Oh, they say provens automatically update. So, Julian, let me tell them the structuring thing, and you can run this past Chris and Sabontin. Since everybody loves the app, right? And they need to incorporate a new company, a tech company, sell the app to the tech company, and allow the app to provide that service across all brokerage houses and charge a fee. Free advice. Right. Hey, man, I will tell you one. And they list that on the stock exchange. Anyway, uh, I'll tell you one. Yeah, man. You see the man all first name basis with Johan. <laughs> <Trouble self>, Julian. <laughs> Someone love trouble, Julian, man. All right, so we'll, we'll pass the stage of questions because we took questions. Oh, hey, Ricardo. All right, so the session is being recorded, but because the session was more practical um, and one I expected a break, the break that we just did, etc., we wanted the ability to cut out. Um, Instead of putting up a, a, a two and a half hour video, wanted the, the ability to kind of cut out the sections that didn't, didn't need to be there. So we're, we're going to do some editing and upload it to the YouTube channel. Um, guys, for, for those that aren't subscribed to the channel, go and subscribe. Stocks and Rocks JA. Also, Learn Grand Invest has a really, really good um, YouTube page as well. Go and subscribe to them. And I think both of us are on Twitter and Instagram. Let's go. Value versus price. Uh, Julian, I don't know if you could walk us through the, I know I'm putting you on the spot, the difference between value and price. Okay, so value ties back to what we mentioned earlier about balance sheets when we spoke to equity or net worth. So normally when you speak to value, we're referring to the net worth of something in many instances, especially assets that are tangible. Now the price is essentially what the market is willing to pay for that specific good or service. So something can have an accounting value or, or a, what we call a book value. Book value is the same as a net worth. A book value of $100 where the price can be 80. And when that occurs, we say that the asset is undervalued. On the flip side, an asset can be worth $100 in terms of the book value, but the market value or the price can be $120. And that $20 extra is called a premium. So we say that that asset is trading at a premium or it is overvalued. So that's, that's our basic breakdown of what we mean when we look at value 
in contrast to price. They're not one and the same. All right. Thanks, Julian. Um, so why do we need to value assets? So I put up some random pictures here. I have a Catherine speak. I know this should really be a water water. I tend to want to support the companies that are listed, you know. Yeah, but Sim, I remember Grace, Grace, own a part of Catch and Speak to you know. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, man. So technically, they own right. 30% of it or something like that. Then get to it, then get to it. So, yeah. we have a water bottle, a car, a bar, a, a brick, a gold, $5,000, we have Rosal, and we have Alaska Financial Services. There. So, when you look at this, but I, as I was saying, I want to know what's the value of something. Now, how we calculate value differs sometimes on the type of asset. And we're going to see, actually see how that applies to the company. So when we're calculating the value of one bottle of Catherine Speak, how do you guys think it is done? One bottle, one single bottle of Catherine Speak. The, the value may very well be calculated on, okay, this is what it costs to make that bottle of water and bring it to you. The, a car, the value of a car um, would be calculated on a cost basis as well. So yes, so early Ardeen said the, the production costs and then they'll add markups, et cetera. But the value is based on some form of cost. Now, with a car and a house, the value can be determined in another way. And it's what we call relative value. So what we're talking about before is absolute value. It's standalone. This market is worth this. Now, what if you buy your market in Mobile? You just buy a 2019 market, so you know Mobile is full of markets, right? For, for good reasons or bad reasons. And your mark, you buy 2019 Markex. You want to know the cost of that market. So you go on, G, you are, you want to buy a Markex. You go on JA Cars. And you say, hmm, that another exact Markex is being sold for $5 million. So that means that my Markex will likely sell around $5 million. So realize that over time, the car becomes less valued more on a cost basis and more on what relative um, assets, assets that are similar are valued. So one of the big phenomenons in Jamaica is that Honda and Toyotas hold a lot of value. One of the reasons why they hold a, a lot of value and it's not just because Funny enough, I, I am biased. I will say it's not because they are, they are the best vehicles. But it's because they are reliable and a majority of Jamaicans like them and are familiar with them and the parts are very available in Jamaica, regardless of the type of brand that you bring in. So it's easier to sell a certain car. A certain car is more liquid and the value on a certain car may hold more in a market. But boy, make you go over BMW and say, oh, you can't get the big job of approving and, you know, VP of asset management. And Julian get, you know, take your own job. And Julian say, you know what? I'm tired of this little car thing. Julian go over ATL and say, show me the best you have. And him say, Mr. Morrison, can you know, when you go certain the car like them, I call it Julian, you know, but when you go over ATL, you know, and Mr. Morrison, them I call you. Mr. Morrison, take your coffee and your tea, you know, and them sit you down in our couch and them bring the brochure and them say, we have this catalog that's on the ship coming. And them show him an X6 2022 X6, you know, full M package. And they say, Julian, we know you're a man of means, you know, so. This one is a nice 33 million. And Julian said, oh, that's in my budget. 33 million, just tell me when it come and I'll come and pick it up. 
I'll have the bank call you, have my people call you. The second Julian put on him license plate on that X6 and drive out of the parking lot. <laughs> the volume moved from 33 million to all 25 million, right? Because the second him drive it out, it becomes a used car and it's not compared based on cost and markups much again, but it's more compared on what other used X6s are being sold for its ability to sell. Now the gold bar is there because there are certain commodities that have an intrinsic value, meaning that there is some implicit value in it. So you have coffee beans, um, and we'll call them commodities in general. Um, wheat, a bit a lot of you guys don't know them trade pork bellies. Yeah man, big, they actually trade pork bellies like on an exchange. You can buy and sell pork bellies. You might not, well, you don't want to end up with the actual delivery, but you can buy and sell <laughs> pork bellies. Yeah, the contract, the contract. Yeah, the contract itself. But you can imagine you just start investing, you could actually buy pork bellies and forget that is a deliverable contract. <laughs> Okima said what? Okay, so for commodities, so there are, so pork bellies are used to make bacon, right? Right? Them, them used to make that's bacon right, that's right. Yeah, man. Bacon is big business, particularly in North America. Yeah, pork stomach, pork bellies. But it's a particular part. Um, bacon is big business in North America. So much so that the farmers have a market we are, um, on which they go to find buyers, right? Over time, of course, that developed into, I don't necessarily want the pork bellies. I just think the price are going to go up. So it may be that the pigs get a disease, mad pig disease, and a big supply of the pigs fell, so the price rose, um, and so the price of pork bellies increased, and I want to speculate on that. Literally, just like a stock. So you can actually do that. Um, I love pork, guys. Don't ruin it for me. Jeremy, you know, I don't eat pork, you know. I don't eat pig, but I eat jerk pork. So, me jerk it. <laughs> me jerk it. Me think, me think, so, the jerk, jerk pork, pork, but not yeah, man. the... Yeah, yeah, man. You don't eat few pork, you know? No, me no, 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 no. Bond that out. Me yeah, eat man. pig. Bond that out. Me jerk pork. Yeah. Right? Same thing, Simon. The same exact thing. <laughs> now, if you look over to the far right, you see a $5,000 bill. That $5,000 bill, it, it's what we call fiat money. It only has value because the government says it has value. Its only value is in the fact. Watch the movie Trading Places. Yes, yes, yes. Funny enough, the first time I watched Trading Places is when I, 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 I found out about the, the commodities exchange. So thanks, Adriel. Um, so the only reason the $5,000 has a value is because the government says so. What we are looking at is stocks. What's the value of a company? Now, the property at the top, there are two ways we can value property. We have, let's just break down property in two main parts, just to not extend this too long. You have residential property and commercial property. Residential property, like let's say you buy a house or Mona, more than likely the value of your house is based on the value of the houses, similar houses around it, right? So if you go Mona, you want to buy a three bedroom, when you, when you call your valuation person at VMR, wherever, they're going to look in their database on similar houses in the same place. They're going to check your structure and everything. And they're going to say, this house is likely to sell for X, right? That's residential. Commercial property is like, uh, you know, Stanley Motor. Oh, oh there's a half a tree road. Commercial property have office build, uh, office, um, like an office building. They can be valued based on what similar office space costs in that area, like New Kingston, for example. So that's a way. Another way is that they're valued by the income that they get, by the cash. 
So this property is worth X to me because I can collect rent on it. So, so there you can value things based on their intrinsic value. You can value it based on like items, their relative value. Um, and of course, intrinsic value is related to your cash value as well. So we spoke about absolute value, and this is determined by what you expect to get from holding. So this is now we're talking about stock, right? So absolute value is what you expect to get from holding the stock. I don't remember if it was Trevon or Julian, but one of them said, I think it's Julian, he said he likes to get paid for holding a stock. How does the company pay you, quote unquote, for holding the stock? They pay you through dividends, right? So there are two. So what we're discussing now is how do we formally identify what the value of a stock is? One of those ways is our absolute um, value or what it's worth internally. So it's based on your dividends or capital gains. We'll come back to this. Another way, so there are two models that we can use discounted cash flow. Actually, there are a lot more than two models, or there are more than two models that you can use free cash flow. There is a dis discounted cash flow model and the dividend discount model. The discounted cash flow model and the dividend discount model really says the same thing, but they, but they use two different bases. One is saying this company is worth as much as the dividends that it pays. And another is saying the cash DCF is saying this company is worth as much as the cash flow that it generates. Right? I like the, the, the DCF better. You guys can, can put in the comments for those that are familiar which one they, which one they, they, they like. The relative valuation, this is very popular. I am very heartened to know that the PE ratio is something that the, even the average investor can say, oh, I've heard of the PE ratio before. The PE ratio is the price to earnings ratio. It's literally, um, the name of it is how it's calculated. Price to earnings. So it's the market price divided by the earnings per share. So if you look in your Excel sheet under the income statement, the earnings per share is the total net profit divided by the total number of shares outstanding. And you guys are familiar with the market price. That's the last close, the close price um, from the previous trading day. Your PB ratio is your price to your book value per share. Your book value per share is total equity divided by total shares outstanding. So these multiples are very popular. Um, there are a lot more multiples, by the way. There's your price sales, price to free cash flow, quite a few more. But the PE and the PB are the most widely used. They can be applied to a wide cross section of companies. They are actually very easy to use. Um, I don't know if you're going to see the issue as yet, but do you guys know what an issue with the relative valuation may be? Just keep in mind the relative valuation, it values your asset based on a similar asset to it. Right? So for example, think about the houses on the top right hand part of the scheme. Let's say you move to Mona and five houses down, a neighbor that is not ideal moves, moves in. The neighbor bringing them 10 pit in them in a three bedroom house. Five boys, five girls. Them always fight each other. Beer nice in the neighborhood. Them dog, them dude up the whole of the sidewalk. Right? They always are jump the fence. They must fight with the other dog them. The house is loud. Some of the friends have friends that aren't ideal either. Them sit down on the road and there's nothing usually wrong with loitering some, sometimes. But them loiter and them troubling neighbors them as them pass. 
Them see a brown in a pass, brown in. What go on? Harassment, right? Them for them friends moving and for them friends moving and for them friends moving. So people start to sell their houses. People start to travel and say, look, I mean, this was a very quiet community and that's the reason why I bought the house. I'm going to sell my house and my house is worth 25 million. I want to sell my house this month. Trevor go to VM and say, I want to sell my house. VM said, boy, we have a buyer, you know, but the buyers, the buyer hear about the neighbors and them hear about the community and the violence and them hear a gunshot most every three weeks and them said them now buy it for 25. Them buy it for 20. Trevor and said, boy, I can't stay one more month. We have to leave now. So Trevor and sell the house for 20. Trevon, Trevon talk to him neighbor and tell him oh, in neighbor Julian say, yo, Julian, I'm out, you know. Can't bother with this. I'm going to buy something in a Trelawney, you know, where the breeze blows strong and the river dead on the road. And time for me, you know, take a time off. I may work from home. So as long as I have internet, I'm good. Julian say, I want to sell to, you know. Julian go to film sales agent and say, I want to sell my house. She said, boy, Julian, they are the going price in the community now is 20 million. Julian said, boy, but I get the valuation at 25. And she said, yes, the valuation is at 25, but people are only willing to buy it at 20. Julian sell theme house. And three other people follow them. You know, say your house is not worth 25 million dollars again. Because it's related to the value of the houses beside of it. This is similar to this is similar to stocks. When the prices on the stock market are high, relative valuation multiples are also high because they use an average multiple. Everybody get that? Everybody understand? Yes, no. Okay. You can repeat that for, you can repeat that for me, please, Simon? Yeah, man. So I'm saying that just like with houses, um, when they and left and drive Honda Civics, when the value of similar properties, vehicles or houses get lower around you, the value of yours also goes down if you're using a relative valuation multiple. Right? So we are going to actually jump into the Excel sheet because now what we want to do, so guys, you have to open the Excel sheet. I'm going to have it on the screen anyway. We are going to value cream, you know, but we're going to make some projections. And guys, projections are very, projections are very subjective. So we're going to work through this together, right? So. Don't, don't be afraid to unmute and say, Simon, I disagree. Probably that should be higher, probably that should be lower, etc. right? So, why is this not showing? All right, so you know. So this is Creamy's 2021 financial year. So this is as at the end of February that we're still in. Clearly, this is an estimation. What I did, very simple, is I assumed that Cream makes the same amount of money in Q4, in their December, January, February period, that they made last year, right? And I was just, just trying to keep it simple. If you scroll over, you will see the quarterly earnings for the last four years. So I'm assuming that for this quarter, for this quarter, it should be February, you know, I'm more than likely I need to put January right there. It should be February. So for this quarter, I am assuming that they make this amount of money. Everybody get that? So one year consists of four quarters, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. And the quarters are broken down here. And if you add up the profits for all of the quarters, 
you should get back the full 2019 earnings. The numbers down here show the quarter over quarter growth. So this 20 million, $21 million is 63% less than it was in the previous quarter, the quarter for the corresponding period. So judging by all of these negative numbers, you can see that Creamy did not have a good 2019 financial year. And that was reflected in the price. So the price, as you see, guys, is right here. Just on the sheet that says price. Um, I think this, this sheet can go longer. I'm not, I don't remember how much years I put in. But you realize the price was coming down in 2019, even before COVID. And that is justified here. They had some bad quarters. Matter of fact, let me put them in red. They had some bad quarters down here. They even had a quarter in 2018, the last quarter where they made a loss. However, since COVID, the first quarter grew by 31%. The second quarter doubled. The third quarter grew by 36%. So it's not hard to argue that the fourth quarter could, could very well be at least what it is here. So what I did, was I just added this, the Q4, to over here. So I just reflected the figures over here. And that's what our, you know what, better yet? No, I think what I did was a trailing. So I just added the last four quarters, sorry. Yeah, this. Yeah, so it's exactly the same thing. So I just assumed that they made back this same $45 million in Q4. Could be less, it could be more, but based on how they're, they've been performing, it's likely to be more. Julian, did did the did creamy say? I remember in one report they said that in a certain season they make less money. Like in the, rainy season. in the rainy season. Yes. Yes, they've mentioned it before. I remember reading that. All right. So we're going to do the projections. These are just a few things. These are just a few nuances with cash with the projections. You see the thing with cash flow projections, and we're talking about DDM here, is you can't do a dividend discount model or you can't use dividends to value a company that does not pay dividends, right? Because the company's value would be zero. The company has to have a solid dividend policy, meaning that it can't be that last, that five years ago, they paid 20% of their earnings, then 80%, then 10%, then 60%, then 20%, right? It has to be relatively consistent. The dividend discount model is usually taken from a, yeah, I can do a PDF and share as well. Thanks, Alicia. I'll, I'll do that. The dividend discount model is also from, from what we call a minority shareholders perspective. So minority shareholders, which are usually the small investors like, like myself, um, a couple of thousand units, a couple of hundred thousand units, and I really brush them. Those investors value the company more from a dividend perspective. And you have to actually believe that you can forecast dividends. If you can't forecast dividends, if you can't tell me what dividends are likely to be next year, then you can't use that valuation method to value the company. For relative valuation, we spoke about this a while ago, but it, it, it's based on a law of one price, meaning that similar goods should be valued at the same thing. So, but, and, and we already spoke about one of the drawbacks. One of the drawbacks is you may have a very good asset, but I am comparing your good asset to somebody's bad asset. So that means it reduces the value of your good asset. Um, so a high market breeds high valuations. And outliers, one of the major problems with a PE multiple is that this earnings per share can actually be negative. If the earnings per share is negative, 
this PE multiple is gone through the door. One, it's a bad thing, because that means them not making no money. But it's gone through the door. Right? Boy, if this book value is negative, then the company not really serious problems. But in these times, the earnings per share is usually negative, so you have to value the company from a different perspective. And the beauty with valuation is you can always use more than one method. In fact, more than one method is best. No single valuation model fits every situation. I took this from online, it's a very good statement. But by knowing the characteristics of the company, you can select a valuation model that best suits the situation. So look at this now. Um, Matthew, uh, Matthew had asked a question further up in the session. I'm going to answer it now. How do you value a company that owns real estate? A company that owns real estate, and tell me if it makes sense. If you own real estate, the value of your company must be close to the value of the real estate that it owns. Right? So the price to book ratio of that a real estate company is usually close to one. Remember the price is what you are willing to pay and the book value is the value of that real estate asset on the company's balance sheet. If you pay, if you go into um, Harborview and you said, and a man said, look, I'll sell you my house for 20 million. And you said, no, me buy, it, me buy it for 25. People that think you're crazy, right? The only reason you would buy a $20 million asset for $25 million is what? What are some of the reasons that would make you pay more for an asset than it's actually worth to somebody else. Because it, I think it's undervalued. Ah, so you, the person, we are selling to 20 million, and here you sell 25, say, well, hell, shit. I mean, if we can get 25, we can get 25. This guy is crazy. He might think you crazy, but you are willing to buy it for 30. Because you know that it's worth more to you as an investor than to him or as a property owner, same thing as investor, than to him. So when you buy that property, um, Chike said it, you believe that there's more value there than him, than he thinks, and that the price is going to increase. So let's use St. Thomas, for example. <laughs> I'm very biased with St. Thomas. I went to St. Thomas a couple months ago and a man was selling a one bedroom house on a quarter acre of land. Actually, it's a little less than quarter acre for $3 million. I was like, $3 million? Brother, there are apartments in Kingston that can buy the whole scheme. However, he bought the house. I mean, it's, it's one of those new schemes that NHT helped with. So, and this is his words, although I can't confirm it. He said he bought the, the land for the proper, um, for the house at about $600,000. And I don't know, fancy house, one bedroom upon it is really a simple one bedroom. It's like a matches box. You know what they used to call matches box, a pop, pop, pop more. But it's a one bedroom. So he probably spend, let's say, a million dollars. He didn't reach a million dollars yet. But. So to him, he spent $1.6 million on the property. And he's selling it for $3 million. He might make a bag of money. But me, I look at it and I say, look, but this highway, where they might build, it's going to be done in about two to three years. The mortgage on a $3 million property is small, less than 20 grand, matter of fact, less than 20 grand a month. If I buy this property for $3 million 
on the highway bill and instead of taking 25 minutes to get from Harborview to St. Thomas, it can now take you 10. The value of the property should go up. So I'm looking at the property and I'm saying, boy, this look like an $8 million property to me. So you realize how different investors can value things differently. And as Matthew said, Tesla, boy, I don't understand. I really don't understand. So, so let's jump back to the forecasting of Creamy. So come forecast this quickly. We forecast line by line, which means that we'll go bam, 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 and we'll go down. Now this sheet is modeler, which means that you can plug in a figure and it changes. So how I look at the, on it, and you may look on it different, is that this company, Creamy, may have a high growth phase. Then the growth phase will become paced. Then it will go into a sustained period. So I say, look, this company has, and let's calculate the CAGR. The CAGR for a company is effectively how much it's grown um, over the last X amount of years on an annual basis, right? So let's look at five years, we could do more. And boy, guys, this formula, just um, Google it, trust me. I, I do it a lot. So I have learned how to, how to just do it out of my head. So hold on, this has to be minus one. Boy, they don't grow much. Hmm? Yeah, the Kega is a compounded annual growth rate, so you can just type that in. Yeah, compounded annual it. growth rate. So their Kega isn't high at all. Boy, it's like maybe right to the 10%. Their their annual, their their relative annual growth in sales is about 10%. That's not much. So let's say that they're able to continue with that, right? That's why I have 10% up here. You could change this to 15% if you want. Let's say you love creamy and you think the creamy are gonna become the biggest ice cream company in the world. You could change it to 50%. Cheekest or probably though, Simon, we should mm -hmm. ask the we should ask the guests if if they be, believe that creamy will grow by by the 10% or they are feeling up, optimistic about creamy that that they be, believe it will grow more than the 10%. Because that 10 is your op opinion, right, Simon? Yeah, yes, it's very subjective. So what do you guys think? Is 10% is, is reasonable? I'm being conservative and using what they already achieved. Which is how much, Livy, Livian? The 10. All right, all right. The Livian is, 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 but remember, you don't have to agree with me now. Oh, our, our Dean said 15. Matthew's a bit more conservative. Matthew got eight. Okay, fine. So, Matthew, Matthew got, Matthew got eight, right? Um, so, you know what? Let's, let's go a little lower, right? You know what, let's, you know, I like 10. I like 10. No, but then again, Simon, though, whichever figure that we do choose, we must be able to justify it. Mm -hmm. So if you believe that it, it will grow by 8%, no. Why? Given that you have seen that it has grown by a Kagar, a Kagar of 10.7%, what would be your reason to now think that your revenue will grow by a less amount for 2021? 20, it can, That's but, a good question, whatever figure, but whatever figure that you do choose, it must be justifiable, right? So it can be the 15, but why? Or it can be eight, 
but why? So there are different reasons that you can take into account. We know that the COVID is still here um, based on the history that Julian had given about the company. You can use that to, you know, make a calculated decision as to how much you will grow your revenue by. I'm, I'm curious to know, Ardine, why did you say 15? Can you hear me? Yeah, man, I can hear you, Ardine. All right. So I was just looking pretty much at the whole, the, their cost of production, cost of sales. Um, their main ingredient, as we had ascertained, is milk powder. And... Um, they have they have stated that they had good amount of inventory so i don't see them having a shortfall in inventory for the next year and so even if the price rises it really not gonna be a big hit to them so they should be able to produce and owing to the climate that we're in where we see an increase in sales i think they can produce too much the sales so i think it's going to rise Okay, okay. So, so Ardine is saying, look, come off a creamy back, uh, Matthew. Come off a creamy back. She so think them can sell. And you know, in the in the analyst room, this is actually how it goes. A lot of people think that as an analyst, you you sit on around your desk and you say, hmm, ten percent, and you just go with it. It's actually different. It's Trevon looking around and Julian and said, Julian, how much do you think this reasonable level grow by? And Julian may say, boy, creamy 2%. Somebody else may say 5 RD in is more bullish. Or oh, Jeremy say you make a, re a reasonable assumption. All right, so let's go with 10. But in the past period, you know, so the rate of a lower, because this is when we are saying, okay, creamy is going to come out of this high growth phase. So do you guys want to go with Matthew's 8% or you think in the pace period it's going to grow lower than that? I go with the 8%. And I'm going with the 8% based on the assumption of I'm looking at the lock step of how the revenue growth also goes with the cost of sales. Ah, and, and, and remember, we are coming with cost of sales, you know. We are coming back to cost of sales. Okay, Chike. 8%, all right. So if, if anybody else is following along, the sheet's supposed to be changing as well. All right, sustain. How much can this company reasonably grow revenues by in the long term? And there's a way that we can do this, but I just want to hear your opinions. My opinion is, over the long term, no company can grow faster than the country that they're in, over the long term. If a company into perpetuity grows faster than the country that they're in, then the company is going to become larger than the country. Get what I mean? So if the growth rate of the company is like this, and the country is like this, it eventually will cross and the company will become larger. But that is, that is theoretical. What do you guys think? NCP. In terms of how, they, of how they always get, they always, their ratings technically, your rating is not supposed to economically go higher than the, than the overall rating of the economy that you are performing in. But yet, NCB's performance, I think, in the last rating was was a bit was a bit higher than the country, than, than Jamaica. Well, you make a you make a good point, Chike. That one is that one is beyond me. And let me tell you why. And not just NCB. Every company in Jamaica's business is dependent on Jamaica's economy. If Jamaica Jamaica's economy contracts then companies, most of them, some of them actually, will also contract because it's based in that country. 
So I usually go with the long-term growth rate of GDP, which is about 1.5%. Jamaica's is very low. Um, so I go with 1.5%. What do you guys think? I, I won't doubt that. I think that's reasonable. <laughs> so I won't doubt it. Julian, wait, oh, wait. On the contrary. On the mm -hmm. contrary, I think this is a boom and crash company mm. because... Interesting. Interesting. But Ardine, Ardine, you're serious, man. I like that. <laughs> because I, I'm thinking of crazy, Jim. I remember growing up, Crazy Jim had this same energy like Creamy. And then all of a sudden, Crazy Jim did not di di diversify. So it practically dead and existed. <laughs> Crazy Jim did. <laughs> go on, go on. It go is on, still on. here, but. That's a very, that's very, very, that's very strong. You know that there's a still, there's, there, Crazy Jim is still here. So I'm just, I'm of the view that the boom season for creamies right now, probably in the next five years, they will be there. But then after that, they are out. Unless it is that they are going to continue to diversify their products in putting new introduction, introduce new items and so on. But outside of that, I think they're going to crash eventually. What do you think, Julian? I don't completely disagree, but what do you think? Well, think? it's on the surface. They, they have some advantages that Crazy Jim doesn't. So they have the linkage with Scoops, because remember that Scoops, is, they have established themselves as ice cream specialists in the region, pretty much. They've established the Devon House brand. So they have what NCB refers to as economies of experience so they can pool human capital and get expert advice so that they can bring down their risk i don't think crazy jim has that at their their disposal um however within that same frame you would you, one would think that having that level of expertise we would have seen better financial performance from a from an operational standpoint in terms of efficiency so i'm a bit disappointed in that regard um i expect better However, I'm just stating the fact that, you know, they have, they're a little different from Crazy Jim in that regard. They also have the capital markets at their exposure. They can raise capital on the market. They can do a right issue. They can do an APO. They can issue bonds. They can do a preference share. I think they can do more in terms of working their capital structure and doing more creative positioning in terms of capital in order to grow faster or grow in a different way. I've seen where they're talking about, where they've mentioned um, being more efficient with regards to energy because we know coal storage is very energy intensive and it takes a lot of power to actually produce those products and I think it's a long time coming. They should have been oriented towards green energy a long time ago. So I mean it's a step in the right direction. They've mentioned it in the last quarterly release. So let's see. Funny enough, Premier. Yeah. Premium has, and as I said, guys, I never look, looked into this into detail. I wanted it to be very authentic. I remember a couple of quarters ago, actually, I think it was in the same period when they were making losses, they were saying, guys, we are retooling. They did some water thing um, to, to get clean water into their, into their plant. Um, they, they, they started to do the green energy thing. And they were saying, guys, just wait a little. Wait a little. We are retooling. So their operating expenses were higher. And their direct expenses um, were relatively higher because of other reasons. I think, I don't think that cream will, I wouldn't say crash. I wouldn't say crash. But I certainly think that they need to diversify their portfolio. They need to expand to the regional retail ice cream market. Um, yeah, yeah, want to see them bringing in some hard currency, bringing in some US dollars, pivot, so yes. to export. Yeah, want mean, to see pivot, some export. pivot, pivot, and think about it. People, and I just want to mention this point people have been telling Radio Jamaica and Palace Amusement to pivot for years, 
for years people have been saying, look, you see what I'm to Palace Amusement now? I think, unfortunately, COVID sped it up. Materially sped it up. However, from I started looking at Netflix a couple of years ago, all the outlooks for cinema was saying that cinema is going to die. Everything was moving online. Disney spent a bag of money and put it into Disney Plus. HBO is doing it. A lot of other players have started to do that because the subscription income provides consistency. And that model is where people are moving towards. No. So personally, I think that this whole thing where they were building cinemas and you know, selling popcorn and the traditional thing, it had to change in some way. Which is why we are also, oh, Jeremy, and I wanted them to make a bag of money off of GameStop. Jeremy said, that's why I'm short GameStop. Uh, another, another thing with, with Crazy Jim, though, is that they're very big on packaging. So I think they actually do yeah, the packaging for Crazy Yeah, they make money from that. Oh, I never, I never know about the packaging part. Yeah, man. They actually package for creamy if, if memory serves me correctly. Okay. So they make money from that, yeah, man. There's, a, right. there's, a, there's a term that I want to inject, which I kind of, that's why I see um, Ordine's point. It's called economic moat. And that's actually what everybody's saying, right? That, that, I, that I learned from the US side of, of, of analysis. If the company the company protects its economic moat, which is basically um, its market share by two things: either it locks out competition by monopoly, or it locks out competition by ensuring that their their, their marketing methodology, etc., and the product that they produce is better than their competitor. So, as we have been saying, pivot all the time. If Creamy doesn't protect its economic moat or grow its economic moat, exactly what Ardeen is, is, is stating more than likely will happen. Yeah, and I think uh, Matthew mentioned that, imagine if they had a subscription package. I, I think another thing is sometimes you should look at the average age of a, at, of a board of directors. That's all I have to say. <laughs> That's all I have to say. So for some of these companies, Look at the average age of the board of directors. Look at their backgrounds. Because look, sometimes the difference between two similar companies is just that if Julian goes to a certain company and says, look, hey, all right, this is what I think we should do, boss. And we can do this better and we can do that better. There are bosses that will say, hey, 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 Julian, Julian, you come see a good thing. And you want to tell with it. Why we don't go do that when this day you're so right here so in front of it? That risky and that, you know? It sounds like a script that most Jamaicans over 50 read from. Like all of them read the same script word for word. Yeah, man. And then there are some companies, there are some bosses, regardless of age too. Some really are talking about the personality and they're not necessarily the age. But it's, 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 it's skewed towards age. There are some companies where the boss is said, hey, we need for the ideation thing. Oh, Bitcoin. Hmm, interesting. Tell me about that. I wonder if we can create our own coin. Um, maybe we should move everything online because, you know, they're thinking. Yeah, like definitely. That. Definitely. Yeah, man. So that's why I, I mean, personally, sorry for the pivot, but yeah, man, the, the, the thing with, with, with Palace hurt me because, you know, Carib kind of have a, a little, you know, Sentimental value. That's where I watched my first movie, Bugs Life. So, yeah. Anyways, so let's go with the consensus. The consensus. I'm going to balance me with Ardeen's um, crash and die, right? So Ardeen is not even saying zero. You know, Ardeen is saying negative 100. It's going to go to zero to, to zero sales. So I will just put it at one percent. You guys can, can do um, however you feel it. So I want you guys to scroll down and look here where it says historical direct expense ratio. Historically, the direct expense ratio, that means the percentage for cost of goods to total sales has been 73, 60, 60, 69, 
But you realize over the last few years, it's actually been at an average of about 67%. You guys see that? It, it's not been very different over the last couple of years. So it's been 1% higher, 1% lower. In 2021, the trailing that we spoke about is actually 66.5, which technically is 67. So how oh, I do it, and guys, please, you can unmute and tell me, sir, I don't agree, and this is what I would do. And remember, these analyses can always be done more detailed. So we could forecast the price of milk powder and do it based on that. Matthew, the direct, the direct expense ratio is total, is cost of sales divided by, so if you, so it's cost of sales divided by revenues. So if you enter 67 here, it will give you, hold on, oh, I enter 67 total. It will give you, oh, it's not in percentage, oh boy. your direct, your cost of sales, right here. So it will automatically calculate it for you. So let's do that for the next couple of years. I think, and this is me, Ardeen, you can tell me some wrong, Julian, Chike, Jermaine, Vlad, Livian, Kadeen, Hector, Dean, Ashley, Alicia, Adrian, you can tell me some wrong. I am willing to say that this will probably be 67% for one more year, 68% for the next three years, and let's say milk powder continues to increase, 69% for the rest of the years in the model. So you realize all of this automatically calculated now, right? So anybody have any different opinions? All right. Selling and distribution expense, same, same treatment. Let's look at what, so selling and distribution expense, guys, is total selling and distribution expense as a percentage of of um of total sales now while selling and distribution is directly related to to sales because it's literally the, the what you expense from moving the product administrative expenses may not be because an admin assistant may get paid the same amount of money regardless of the amount of ice cream that is produced so this one is very easy. You guys realize this? You guys see this? It's very easy. This is almost 4% every year, apart from two years. 4%. Matter of fact, it's 3.4% in the last year. So I am, I am a bit more, I don't know why I say conservative again. I usually go with the in-between. You could set up a column that works out the average of these. Oh yeah, man, I, I, could, have, I could have done that. I, I was grappling for space here. But yeah, man, you can, you can do that to the sheet. I, oh yeah, check it, check it to the words out of my mouth. I go in between. So if the low end is three and the next one is four and they're so very close, I will go with 3.5%. Oh, and a 3.5 and just enter. I'm on the hunger kicking, man. So, because when I look at this historically, watch the For the last six years, including the quarters, the selling and distribution expense is very consistent. So, you know what? I will go in on the long end and say, look, this is going to stay consistent over the next 10 years. And guys, you don't have to forecast for 10 years if you're not going to use it. So 
we can move on to admin expenses. The last one is 23.19. Oh boy, this one is this one is fairly intuitive too. The quarters are 23. 2020 is 23. 2019 is 22. Then 20. Admin expenses actually seem to be increasing with the business, even though it's not as consistent. So how do you, how you guys think I should do this? You think I should use the percentage? Because you don't have to, you know. You think I should use 23%? Can you use 23%? First thing I want to wonder is why admin expenses keep rising and we're not productive. That's my first peeve. And then I'm thinking that owing to the fact that we are in a technological age, can't we decrease some of this admin, the whole manual portion? All right. I remember so, that remember that further down the road we go we go crashing off. So I mean All right. So Ardine is saying Okay, Jermaine, okay. <laughs> So Arlene is a shareholder, you know. That's why she has said we. So, so look at this. What we can do, you know, remember we can it's modular. Arlene is saying as the company grows in the, in the space, tech is going to become more important. They can outsource HR, they can outsource IT soon and very soon. The only people that you will need in the office are the CEOs and the and the core admin staff. So you are doing, you think that this ratio is going to fall back to 22? Yeah, pretty much. All right. Ardeen says 22. And do you think it's going to stay at 22 or do you think it's going to fall again? It's going to continuously fall as the, as the years progress and technology becomes more and more rampant where it's going to come to become a point where we are forced to use the technology it's like we're not going we really and truly not going to have no choice come the next five years so okay. i think but it's just going to keep going another side of the coin is so remember that as so as you believe that you are growing year over year right and um, you be, be, believe that you will need less people. What that means, though, is you are growing. So your cost of that technology also will also grow. Right? So it's, you know, it's two, it's two sides of the same coin. Because the more that you produce, you will need to basically buy whatever machine that you want to, to buy to take over these tasks. So while I can ag agree with it going down to 22, I don't see it going down by much. But that then, fast. Siobhan, that fast. If that we, fast. If we run in on capex right wouldn't it be a case in which we would now be capturing all of these administrative costs wouldn't it now be a percentage towards depreciation instead of an actual percentage in labor and wages and them something labor and wages so, yeah so because the the the, the actual administrative portion that you would be capturing you the all of that would have been transferred into capex so you are now going to be depreciating no, an asset the knowledge of flow, the knowledge of flow. Oh, <laughs> so 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 Ardeen has said and i think Ardeen Jeremy said it as well depends on whether it's yeah. capex or opex Ardeen is saying that maybe the expenses will shift from admin so if you buy more so, capital, more more like um, technologically based things that are depreciated at a higher rate, that would actually yeah. add to the depreciation expense. But Ardeen, you are supporting Trevon's point because that means that the reduction, the, the, the expense ratio now will change significantly. Because they are just shifting it. Because it's just a shift. 
Boy, I okay. said so the analysts are on this player. RD, you see, you saw RD in the quiet the first oh, RD, game. Yeah, man, she quiet, but so to come out, read, I love it. I read, I love she it. She read with you know, she da read with. She da say, all right, me go watch with them boy, I say, man. And then me go just... Yeah, man, the call, the call serious enough, say, man. You say, oh, Libby, Libby, and serious mm. knowledge that, you know. Serious, so, so, so what they have knowledge, just, you know. So, Libby just stay in the background, so, me know. Oh, man. man, she dangerous, man. She just a listen. Oh, she want to strike Come like on, Libby. Guardian. Yeah, man. All right, so, so, Trevon, so, I guess the consensus, so, 23... It's going to decrease, but it now will consistently decrease. I want to point out something to you guys. Because we are keeping expenses increasing and sales fell in 2027, you realize that profits also fell in 2027. This is a normal business cycle, you know, you realize. So we have the, the growth phase will go up and then we naturally see it coming back in the numbers down. This is just how business is. All right, all right. So this finance income, guys, for finance income, as we say, this session, we're not going in detail. We could go in a lot of detail with finance income. But just to keep it simple, let's say that we keep finance income constant, yeah? Let's say that we keep it relatively constant over the 10 years. So just the same $1 million. Um, finance costs now, it's a bit different. Let's see how finance costs has behaved. The company doesn't take on a lot of debt. They don't take on a lot of debt. Average finance costs has been about 16 to 17 uh, million dollars on average. Um, the trail in 12 months is 17 million. For this one, what you guys think? I have a, I have an opinion. What, 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 you, what you guys think? Livian? Oh. oh man, somebody have beat some music, man. All right, what you guys think about finance costs? Sixteen. All right, so you want to keep all right. Let's no, go no, on. no, because it's high. Yeah, 16, 16, 16. Well, Matthew, make a good point, you know. Matthew is saying he thinks that finance costs will go up in the high growth phase. Let's say it goes up by 1%. No, I know one. want it would go by 1%. You, you want it to go by a decent amount. Let's say go by 5% for the two years. And then Matthew is saying that it will stay, it will go down after. Hmm. Okay. I remember, guys, we can be a lot more detailed, you know. We can be a lot more detailed, but we just want to keep it simple, all right? Almost 10 o'clock. <laughs> so, Hold on. Let, me, let me ask a question. The finance hmm. cost is really the cost for financing. Yeah, so the finance cost, that's a good question. Arlene, you work in a finance? No. Yo, you stay someone. Go on, so. So that, that's <laughs> a good question. Finance cost here, more than likely, although I'm I'm pretty sure I'm almost 100 percent sure that it's interest cost plus um any FX translation cost um that they uh, that they incur. So it's not just debt. But a majority of it is interest costs. All right. Now, the tax thing now. Anybody remember what we said about the junior market tax? They listed in 2013. That means that the 10 year period is up in. So we have our section for tax. When is the 10 year period up? 2023. 23. Yeah, 20. So let's let's assume here. So half of remember guys, remember they're paying half. Mm -hmm. But they're paying half, half of the ink the ink the corporate income tax. So that's twelve and a half percent, half of twenty-five. Um sorry, Matthew said I think I think something to mention uh -huh. that we have been established which phase premium is currently in. 
how do we know that this was not there? Ah, this is a very good question. So, Matthew, actually an assumption that I made at the start of the session, an assumption, I remember the assumption can actually change based on the growth rates that you use up here, right? The assumption was that creamy is going into a, a three-year high growth phase, then pace, then sustain. However, you can adjust the phase by changing the growth rates. So let's say you think that they're actually in the sustain phase now. And they'll stay sustained for 10 years. But in 10 years, you think they'll go into a high growth phase. You can do that as well. Yeah, man, Jermaine. All right. Thanks. Uh, yeah, man. So we, are, we, made that, we made that assumption at, 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 at the top of the session. Let me just put this back. All right. So we are taxes. We're almost finished. So they're going to pay 12.5% to 2023. And guys, you know, we could get granular and we could go down to the amount of months. But as I say, we're keeping it very simple. So then they're going to pay the 25%. You realize that as they start to pay 25%, the profits go down. So they're paying the 25%. And you see, the projections come out at this. So we have full projections now. I'm just going to, to, to take like three minutes and run through the, the model. So you guys, when you go back, they can use it. So I have a DDM model here. What the DDM model does, it assumes that the company pays out 50% of their profits each year. So that's the payout ratio. It calculates what we call the required rate of return. So just like how a debt, the required rate of return on debt is what? The interest costs. The required rate of return on um, equity can be calculated through what we call a cap, which here it's estimated to be 12%. When I send you the slides, um, you will see the, the, the formula there. Actually, I have it there. Yeah, I actually have it here. All right. So, what this does is it discounts the dividends over the period of time, calculates your terminal value automatically, and it spits out a fair value price. I forgot to label this, my apologies. It spits out a fair value price, and the fair value price, this is saying is $1.15. That no look good, <laughs> right? That no look good because cream is currently trading at at five dollars. This means that two things. It's actually it's, it may be that cream is actually worth a dollar fifteen, which I don't believe, or something is wrong with the with the with the model. Or remember, who says certain models work in certain times? This DDM model may just not be applicable to to this company. So that's why we do more than one model. So for this model, ah, thank you, Matthew. So if you remember in the slide, they aren't a dividend paying stock. So that's actually one of the criteria to use the DDM. So you guys realize the problem with the DDM here. We did a perfectly fine DDM because this model automatically calculates. So you, when you guys are value other companies, you can use it. And the DDM come out to $1.15. So it, it implies that something is, is of the issue here. And Matthew said, rightfully so, they aren't a heavy dividend paying stock. But let's look at the relative value. So, what, what, what we usually do with the relative value is we look at like companies and then we calculate an average of their PEs and their PBs 
and then we multiply it by the, the, the expected earnings next year. So in 2021, which ends February, so we should actually use 2022 here because this year is actually done already. So this 26 cents should really come, and I put the EPS right below here. Oh, it's the same thing. Book value per share and the book value is there. Yes. So what happened is that for this, we're using a multiples based approach. Um, you guys can get the historical multiples from this, from this um, sheet. What we we'll do is we average the PE, the, the PE ratios. I got this from Bloomberg. So this is premium material. I got this from Bloomberg. So you average the PEs, you average the PBs, and I'm just running through with you. If the average PE is, let's say, 16, and the average PB, no, let's put it at 18 and a half. Because junior market companies typically trade at a higher P, um, PE. And the average PE is, let's say, 2.5. Simon. Mm -hmm. Simon. Yeah, Jovan. So I had, I had just um, brought, brought up a stock, a, a stock sheet. And based on the pair companies that you had here, I had looked for their PEs and their PB. So if you want, I can give you those figures so you wouldn't have to guess oh, thanks. what the average is. Thanks, Trevon. Um, you can tell me them now. So last them, it's, it's, it's PE is 15.30. Mm -hmm. The PB 2.45. Sixteen point six two for Honeybun, and the PB is three point one nine. Twenty five point five zero. Boy, jump to your trade high man. Yeah. And what's the PB? And three point two nine. Three point two nine. Why would jump team not trade high? We need to see them last quarterly report. Whew, wow. <laughs> oh, so, um, Trevon, I assume this, this doesn't include their latest earnings. Oh, it wouldn't. Okay, so it's probably lower than this. All right, so here what, guys? We're going to exclude Jam T because the earnings is probably, is probably um, the P is probably going to be a lot, a lot lower than 25. Uh, 25 zone <laughs> high, you know? All right, so the average PE and PB works out to be 17.2 and 2.65. Guys, there are a lot of considerations that we can have here. But what we do is we'll multiply the average PE by the, the forecasted earnings per share for next year. So if you look in the sheet, it's this 26 cents right here. These are the forecasted PE um, earnings. So you multiply your average PE times the earnings per share to get a projected price, and you multiply your average PB times your book value per share to get an average price. You realize there's a little distance between them. That's a whole other consideration. But what we usually do is we average them. When you average them, it gives a price of 548. So Effectively, so as I said, there are a lot of considerations that you could do here with multiples because these multiples are very what, what, what we call um, subjective. How you, how you do a lot of this is subjective. So Trevon may look at 2.65 and say, boy, 2.65 is too high. Um, RD may look at the historical multiples for creamy only. Um, Livian may say, look, it should, I'm not buying that for more than 12 times. It really depends on, on, on how you look at it. And Chike may have another method. So this is how we come up with the price. And you realize it, it spits, it averages it out. 
and it spits out a price of 548. Yes, oh, this disclaimer, disclaimer, big disclaimer. You realize that we did a lot of simple justifications going through this. A lot of simplicity was included in this, which means that we could have gone into a lot more detail and done a lot more work to get a value that may be more reflective of their, of creamy. So this is not necessarily their, their fair value. So don't go up on Twitter and say Simon say creamy's value is 548. Why? Don't, please don't do that. This, this model, Simon say, <laughs> this model, the way it's, it's, it's put together, automatically spits out a price what once everything is 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 put the right place right so that's how this price was come about so you guys can go back and you can work through this and you can um reassess and you can change the assumptions Dean. you can make the company crash and die so them get a value of one dollar um etc i but still have the question mm -hmm. Why um, DDM? Why is it that we, is it possible that we could use the DDM and change the dividend, that 50%, the payout ratio, seeing that they do pay dividends, but their dividends look like it's even less than 2%. Yeah, but that would, be, that would make it, so you're saying the dividend payout ratio should be less? Yeah. Well, I'm, going to show I'm just you asking if that was uh, that would have been. A, um... Of course, I can do that, but I'm going to show you what's going to happen. You see that? You have twenty percent. Oh, oh, okay. What you? Yeah. Well, so... friend, you know, when they say you have a while ago, you sound like the lady that said you have one minute left. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so guys. Yes, the lower GK perfectly correct. The lower it is, the worse it gets. So, guys, I know this has been a very long session. Um, you guys can 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 communicate um, with us via via email or on social media. Um, yes, it's very dense. Chic, um, Vlad, trust me. I we can do a a, a one week session evaluation or a three hour session. It's really a lot. So I just uh, push you guys to look through the model, um, assess everything, and feed your questions on Twitter, and, and the guys will try their best to answer everything that you have. And thanks again. To, uh, I really appreciate you guys spending the time with us tonight. Yeah, man, Matthew, we'll leave our, we'll leave our work. We'll leave our work. Forget it, model. Oh, and there's a new section as well. As you realize, the new section isn't finished, but... You guys get the idea. News is very important as well. Right? All right, guys. Thanks again. Um, thanks, Stern Grand Invest team. Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks, Julian and Trevon for, for the support tonight. And the video will be edited and shared within a week and a half. So certainly before the next um, session. And RD, I'll remove the part when they say crash and burn. So that Mr. Clark don't have you up and block you on Twitter. All right, guys. <laughs> okay. Actually, it's okay. Um, the video will be edited and uploaded on YouTube soon. All right, guys. Take care. Thanks All right, everybody. guys. Yes, guys. Massive big up. Thank you. Yeah, man. Thanks.